hati, kegembiraan, kepercayaan diri, serta pertumbuhan yang optimal. Selamat datang di Universitas Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta. 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 Yogyakarta.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the seventh International Language and Language Teaching Conference 2020. My name is Laksmita, and I'm going to be your master of ceremony for today and tomorrow. This annual conference is organized by the English Language Education Study Program at Sanata Dharma University. This conference is usually held at Sanata Dharma venue, but due to the pandemic situation, we decided to hold this year's conference virtually. We feel that despite this unfortunate condition, we should not stop contributing to the society. This two-day conference is accessible at two YouTube channels at Humas USD and PBI USD. I would like to greet our honorable guests, the keynote speakers, Dr. Naima Bihan from Leeds Beckett University, United Kingdom, Dr. Peter Sayer from Ohio State University, Dr. Rose A. Upor from Dar, Dar es Salaam University, Tanzania, Professor Novita Dewi, PhD from Sanata Dharma University, Ibu Johanna Feniranda, PhD from Sanata Dharma University, Ibu Cecilia Tutiandari, PhD from Sanata Dharma University. I would also like to um, say hello to our respected guests, Bapak Dr. Eka Priyatma, the President of Sanata Dharma University, Bapak Oda Teda Ena EDD, the Vice Rector for International Affairs, Bapak Dr. Johannes Harsoyo, MSE, the Dean of the Faculty of Teachers Training and Education, Bapak Paulus Kuswandono, PhD, the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs and the President of the English Language Education Association, Ibu Risha Purnama Devi M. Hum, the chairperson of the Indonesian Language Education Undergraduate Study Program. Bapak Dr. Kunjono Rahardi, the chairperson of the Indonesian Language Education Graduate Program. Bapak Hirmawan Wijanarko M. Hum, the chairperson of the English Letters Sanata Dharma University. I would like to also welcome our moderators for the keynote speech sessions. Ibu Veronica Tri Prihadmini M. Hum M.A., the chairperson of the English Language Education Undergraduate Program, Bapak Concilianus Lausmbato EDD, the chairperson of the English Language Education Graduate Program, Bapak Paulus Sarwoto PhD, the chairperson of the English Language Studies Graduate Program, and Dr. Madi Frida Yulia, the faculty member of the English Language Education Study Program. I'd like to welcome our respected presenters and participants. We have 119 presenters in the parallel sessions, coming from 53 local and overseas institutions and from 10 countries, Algeria, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Sweden, Tanzania, Thailand, United Kingdom, United States, and Vietnam. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you to Yogyakarta, Indonesia, to Sanata Dharma University. Before we begin the conference, let us ask for God's grace and blessing so that our two-day conference will run smoothly. The prayer will be done in the Catholic way. In the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, amen. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, let us pray, asking God for the grace of language. Language is the mind, the heart, the tongue that speaks, to utter, to greet, to mutter the greet, that the wonder of the universe, the secret of the wind, the depth of the ocean, the heart, and the mind may be shared to our knowledge, amusement, and joy. The young learn languages to serve to dream, to build the generous wisdom 
to happy culture but most importantly to listen to the voiceless the forgotten the unspoken we ask for the grace in this new era of speeches arts networks pictures and colors of the language of respect and the server and walker are building as walker and builder are server as server makes walker a builder we learn and we teach the language that unravels boundaries to open the cultural space left by the demise of domination or the new era of conversation may god bless the seven international language and language teaching conference amen Amen. In the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us rise and sing Indonesia's national anthem, Indonesia Raya. seated. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite the chairperson of the 7th International Language and Language Teaching Conference to give her welcoming speech. Ibu Christina Cristiani, PhD, the time is yours. Thank you, Ibu. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished keynote speakers, presenters, guests, and participants in this grand function. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you in the 7th International Language and Language Teaching Conference. This 2020 LSEC is held online and brings language learning in the new era as the theme of the conference. 
The thing describes our teaching struggle during this pandemic situation and our adjustment to the new era. And this difficult time has been shaping us into innovative and transformative people. The conference gathers ideas and best practices by practitioners to educate young generation in the new domain. And the committee pursues many aspects and cases and managed to arrange 190 presentations from nine overseas countries in a two-day conference. So including Indonesia, we have 10 countries, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and the United Republic of Tanzania, Sweden, Algeria, India, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The great ideas come from 53 different institutions, including schools and universities. This year, LLTC presents six keynote speakers in the field of language education, language teaching material, technology used in teaching, literature, and applied linguistics from the United States of America, the United Kingdom, the United Republic of Tanzania and the Republic of Indonesia. Honorable guests and speakers, on behalf of the 2020 LLTC Committee, I would like to thank our sincere gratitude to Dr. Peter Sayer from the United States, from Ohio State University, Dr. Nani Mahan from Lee State University, and Dr. Rose A. Alford from Jerusalem University as the keynote speakers from the overseas countries. Our sincere gratitude also goes to Professor Dr. Novita Dewi, Dr. Johanna Penirandia, and Dr. Cecilia Sutiandari from Kanata Dharma University, who are willing to share their ideas as the keynote speakers in this conference. Also, we are grateful to have the opportunity to facilitate our distinguished presenters to share the light in the education field through their talk. This conference can run smoothly due to the great and best support from Sanata Dharma University and all committee members who have given their excellent contributions working hand-in-hand -hand seriously and keeping the health protocol during the preparation. So let me give my sincere appreciation to all committee members, my colleagues and students. The committee owes great thanks to the faculty of teachers training and education, the English language studies, the English language education master program, the Indonesian language education study program, the Indonesian Language Education Master Programs of Sanata Dharma University, which have made this conference possible. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you will gain new insights and have memorable sessions with us. Finally, I would like to quote from Barbara Kingsolver, an American novelist. The very least you can do in your life is to figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it under its roof. This quote reminds us to inhabit hope in order to activate it. So let us share our hope for the future education and share our best practices with others. Enjoy the conference and thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu Christina Cristiani. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have another speech from the president of Sanata Dharma University. However, since he's unable to join us live, he made a recorded video speech to welcome all of you. Let us watch Dr. Eka Priyadma's speech. Honorable speakers, presenters, and participants of 7 LLTC 2020, a very good morning to all of you. On behalf of Sanata Therma University, 
I am honored to welcome all of you in the seven language and language teaching or LLTC conference. I also would like to extend my warmest regard to all of you. Let us first thank to the Almighty God for the grace we have received in preparing this conference. I do hope this conference facilitated us an effective means to strengthen our role and improve our knowledge contribution as lecturers as well as as researchers. I also wish that the seventh LLTC facilitates a fruitful sharing and exchange of ideas related to the conference themes on language learning in the new era. The choice of this theme is very relevant, not only in relation to the advances in information and communication technology, but especially with the reality of the COVID-19 pandemics, which has lasted more than half a year. Even though the COVID-19 pandemic raises various problems in managing language learners, for me, it is also provides valuable experiences for fundamental transformations. Online learning we are experiencing for the last six months has sparked new awareness and imagination about the essence, the role and position of higher education in society. This awareness is a capital for academics, for the government, and for our community to restructure language learning for the sake of improving its quality and also for reaching out to those who are unfortunate. As we have already known, the discourse of transforming learning has been going on for the last three years through the topic of Industrial Revolution 4.0. But it has not rolled out because of the difficulty of overseeing changes. Now we have good momentum because the pandemic forces all educational institutions to experience the implementation of online learning. Lectures, education staff, official, and students learn a lot to live out this online relationship model. The online model not only half of the problem of pandemics, but also places the pandemic as a driver of change. Higher education is actually the most prepared institution to face the pandemic problem. This is a consequence of the essence of higher education as a knowledge manager that can use information technology as a means to represent and also to disseminate information and knowledge. And we already experienced, I think experienced that digital knowledge representation is sophisticated and make it easier for all parties who want to learn. The rise of webinars is a strong evidence of how easy, cheap, and flexible to disseminate knowledge across space-time boundaries. Therefore, I position this conference as a highly relevant response to the recent call to all of us in improving our learning quality while we are witnessing the rapid change of modern learning that is much influenced by sophisticated smart technology. I do hope that this conference becomes a good avenue not only to discuss our recent finding, but also to facilitate 
a fruitful dialogue in which sharing of knowledge, values, and awareness of language learning takes place with joy and respect to each other. It is through such an orientation that we can proactively contribute to set up our new generation for the betterment of our society. Lastly, may the webinar be successful and enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eka Priyadma. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the first two keynote speeches, let us sing or listen to in, uh, Sanata Dharma University's hymn. Presenters and participants, we will provide the exit ticket for day one right after the third keynote speech. The link will be available at around 3.30 in the afternoon. This exit ticket will be your attendance list for the first day of the conference. We will do the same thing tomorrow on the second day. Please note that you will be eligible to receive the e-certificate only if you have submitted the exit ticket for day one and day two and have res registered your email at the website. Should you have any questions, you may contact our help desk found in the Zoom chat room. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving on to the first session of the conference. In this session, until 10.30 Western Indonesian time, we will listen to two talks. The first talk will be delivered by Dr. Peter Sayer from Ohio State University, and the second talk will be delivered by Ibu Johanna Feniranda, PhD, from Sanata Dharma University. These talks will be moderated by Ibu Veronika Triprihatmini, MA, the chairperson of the English Language Education Study Program at Sanata Dharma University. For participants, you can post your questions in the Zoom chat room if you are joining us from Zoom, or you can write down your questions in the YouTube comment box if you are joining us from YouTube. Ibutri Prihatmini, the time is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ibu Mita. Very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all participants of the seventh 
international language and language teaching conference in different time zones. Can you all hear me clearly? All right, thank you. My name is Veronica Triprihatmini, and I feel very honored to be here chairing two distinguished speakers in this conference. In this very first session, we are going to have Dr. Peter Sayer from the Ohio State University. Hello, Dr. Sayer. Good evening there in Ohio. Can you hear me clearly, Doctor? Yes, I can hear you OK. Good morning, everyone, or good evening here in Ohio. All right. Well, and uh, we also have Dr. Johanna Veniranda from the English Language Education Study Program, Sanata Dharma University. Hello, Ibu Veni. Hello, everyone. All right. OK. This session will last in about two hours, and each keynote speaker is given about 45 minutes to have the presentation. And we will use the remaining 30 minutes for question and answer session. In this conference, Dr. Sayer will be presenting about trends in language education in North America, and Dr. Feniranda will be presenting about her views on how to enhance progress in online speaking classes. And if you have any question, please feel free to post the questions through the chat rooms of this Zoom meeting and also YouTube streaming, which will be open 15 minutes before the presentation time is over. And uh, before we have the presentations, let me reach the short bio data of the two keynote speakers. And operator, please show the slides, please. Well, uh, our first keynote speaker is Dr. Peter Sayer um, from the Ohio State University, Department of Teaching and Learning, College of Education and Human Ecology. Uh, Dr. Sayer got his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from the University of Oregon and his Master's Degree in Applied Linguistics from Universidad Autónoma Benito Juárez de Oaxaca, Mexico. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And he earned his doctoral degree from Arizona State University majoring in language and literacy. Uh, Dr. Sayer is an associate professor of language education studies at the Ohio State University. And his research focuses on social linguistics and multilingual education. He is the author of over 50 publications. Wow, this is a very, very big number. And also including book, Tensions and Ambiguities in English Language Education. And I think this book is very uh, relevant for us at the moment. Okay, he is currently the editor of the TESOL Journal and co ed co-director of Baha'i Language Education Resource Center. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sayer has a very long CV, 28 pages, and if I read it, I'm afraid that I will take most of the time in this conference. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Sayer. Dr. Sayer, the time is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you for that um, introduction, and thank you for um, moderating this session here. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Christina um, Cristiani uh, as the chairperson of the LLTC 2020 committee. Thank you so much for, um, we were exchanging emails back and forth to get this organized. I really appreciate um, your attention and um, and the invitation as well. And also thank you to um, Patricia, uh, Patricia uh, Angelina, the secretary as well for facilitating this. I also want to thank um, one of our doctoral students here at the Ohio State University who's from Indonesia. Her name is Yuseva uh, Iswandari. Um, she was the one who originally put us in contact, Christina and I in contact with each other. So I want to say thank you so much, Chris, um, Yuseva, for that. Um, I, I'm really happy to um, be, have the chance to talk to everyone. Um, and this is my first time doing like a big keynote in a virtual setting. So um, I hope this goes okay, but I hope, also hope that next time I will be able to go to Indonesia and do this in person. I've never been there before and, I'm, and I have a lot of um, good friends and students from Indonesia. So I really, really want the opportunity to visit, um, to visit Indonesia at some point. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here virtually, but I also would like to um, 
be able to visit and uh, meet everybody in person. Um, also, I, I'm, I'm a little tired now because it's actually, it's about 9.30 at night uh, here in Ohio. It's, it's Thursday night still. I'm seeing everybody, you guys are like in the future for me, right? You guys are Friday morning already. So right here it's, it's dark and uh, kind of cold and rainy outside. And I saw everybody in the chat was saying, oh, it's a beautiful morning here in Indonesia. So I'm also very jealous of, of everybody with the nice, um, beautiful weather there in Indonesia. Um, but what I'd like to do, um, tonight in, in my talk, and, and I would just say thank you again to Veronica for the introduction. The only thing that I would add to that is, um, I'm actually originally from Canada. You said you had 10 countries here, but maybe we could add Canada as well, since that's where I was originally from. Um, I also lived for a number of years uh, down in Mexico as well. So I'm kind of, I've been in, in three different countries now, um, uh, living in three different countries. Um, and so um, that's a little bit about me as well. Um, I'm also gonna include my, my email address. There's my website there. Um, and I'm happy to correspond with anyone if you want to um, follow up, if you have any questions uh, or anything you would like to um, contact me with afterwards. I'd be very happy to talk to you. But um, what I thought I would share with you today is some of the trends that are happening here in North America. And I say North America, as I mentioned, it's, for me, Canada, um, the United States, and Mexico are all countries that, that I've lived in and have a very um, close uh, affiliation to. Um, and when I say language education, uh, I'm mostly going to be or dual language education here in the U.S. Often that means Spanish, English, but also there's Chinese and English and lots of other programs, some other language combined with English usually here in the U.S. Or in Canada, it's often um, English and French programs. Um, and then also what we often call here world language education or foreign language education. So this is where um, you know we teach foreign languages here in the U.S. Um, often in, in high school, but sometimes also in, in, um, in, uh, in primary education as well. So this is what I mean by language education. And what I'd like to do is talk about um, three main trends that, that I see has been um, very influential in the last um, 10 years or so um, in shaping language teacher education. And this is my area. Uh, you, uh, uh, Veronica mentioned that my area is really in sociolinguistics, but it's sociolinguistics of language education. And I work a lot with, um, with language teachers here in those three different areas of language education. So what I'd like to do is talk about three trends that I see that have really been from, at least from sociolinguistics, have been shaping language teacher education. This is translanguaging, culturally relevant pedagogy, and intercultural competence. And so I want to kind of give a, a little kind of definition or explanation of each one of those, and then give you an example um, of each of these three different areas. But also I see these three different areas is also very interconnected. And so at the end of my talk, what I want to do is sort of show how those three areas are, are connected to each other and what I understand is the, as the connections. So let me go ahead and get started. And I wanna frame this by saying, again, as I say, these are recent trends. In a sense, this means that uh, we're kind of maybe changing here, maybe our, our more sort of traditional view of language education and moving towards um, kind of a new understanding. So traditionally, for example, we thought in language education, we should try to get students to minimize L1, minimize their first language because we needed to maximize the use of the target language. Usually here, this is, this is English, right? However, what I wanna suggest is this is being questioned or sort of thought about differently now and we're seeing L1 as a resource. And so I wanna introduce the, the concept as translanguaging. Some of you may have heard of this concept. Also, I would say that traditionally we focused on methods and the, the linguistic stuff of language, the language itself, right? And now what we're understanding is we also need to complement that with a focus on students and families. And this is a concept we would call culturally relevant pedagogy. Finally, I think traditionally we focused on um, the native speaker, right? So myself coming from Canada or people we think of from the United States or Britain or other um, quote unquote inner circle countries, right? As the, the model uh, for English language education. And nowadays what we think of as uh, what's probably more important is intelligibility and thinking of English again in, in a global sense, right? Sometimes referred to as English lingua franca. And so there I wanna talk about the concept of intercultural competence. So those are the three concepts I'd like to, um, to uh, talk about in terms of the trends affecting language teacher education in North America. So the first one I, I would say is, you know, this rethinking of the role of 
the first language in language teaching. And so I think, again, traditionally, um, at least when I started um, teaching, you know, about 25 or so years ago, um, what our, my job was, was to try to maximize the input in the target language. And you may, you know, probably be familiar with sort of these, these um, very kind of cognitivist views of second language acquisition based on the work of Stephen Krashen and others who, um, again, would argue that the, the main thing that we need to try to provide for students is input, you know, lots of comprehensible input. And so that was sort of seen as our job was to try to maximize that input and to try to create, in a sense, like a target language zone, right? And so you can kind of think that image there of the, the student in a bubble. We were trying to create the classroom as sort of this bubble where you were maximizing the use of the target language and at the same time trying to minimize or even eliminate the use of the first language because the first language is seen as a source of um, source of interference. So what I would suggest is nowadays we're sort of thinking about, you know, how, how, how true is all of that, right? How, how, how much are those assumptions that we've made about those things, um, how much they really hold water? And in rethinking the role of the first language in second language classrooms, I think what we're recognizing is really the goal of language teaching is to try to have our students be bilingual or, or probably multilingual in the case of Indonesia, where there are you know, speakers of so many different languages. Often you know, you're speaking um, even three or four languages as you're learning English, right? And so really our goal then is to try to have students become multilingual. And so the question then becomes, well, how should we use languages? Um, how should we organize the use of languages in classrooms? And what types of multilingual practices can support um, second language learning, right? And so I guess I would say the first trend here, this, this, this concept of um, translanguaging, um, this really comes from the work of a scholar uh, named Ofelia Garcia. Ofelia Garcia is in um, New York. She's originally from Puerto Rico, um, which is uh, a Spanish-speaking territory here in the US. And so she herself grew up bilingual and sort of understands these bilingual communities here in the United States. And so she says, she sort of gives us this idea of what she now calls translanguaging from a, a perspective of bilingual education and particularly Spanish English bilingual education here in the US. And so we've taken this idea of translanguaging from bilingual education and sort of made us think about TESOL and English language teaching kind of in a different way and sort of thinking of TESOL more now as plurilingual education, right? And again, Make, basing on this premise that really how we should be thinking about TESOL classrooms as multilingual spaces, right? Instead of trying to avoid the first language, we should maybe try to think about how do we embrace the first language. And what Ophelia Garcia says is that, yeah, I mean, this actually makes sense because if we think about like, what is bilingualism really? When you think about kind of, um, you know, what are bilingual people or multilingual people doing with their languages? She says that the better metaphor, like what we usually think of as bilingualism is like this bicycle, right? You have L1 and L2, you have the front wheel and the back wheel. And you know, they can kind of spin and move your bicycle around, but each wheel is kind of like separate, right? She says, no, that's not really how, you know, cognitively how we organize languages in our mind. These aren't like in separate places. You know, I have English and Spanish in my case, in my mind, or you have Indonesian and English or Javanese and Indonesian. These are not like in separate places in your mind. What she says is really what bilingualism is like a better metaphor instead of the bicycle, a better metaphor would be the banyan tree. And I know in Indonesia, you guys know banyan tree, right? Is this um, amazing tree that's like, it seems like one tree, but actually it's created out of the combination of lots of different, um, lots of different things all interwoven together, right? And that, she says that's kind of a better way of thinking about um, multilingualism, right? And so the idea then of translanguaging, and if you look at what, you know, what bilinguals do, um, it might be that you're more comfortable, you know, speaking in, in Javanese for some, you know, situation or in Indonesian for another situation or in English for another situation. That is to say that our, you know, for us as multilinguals, it's not like we have like perfect balanced proficiency or competence in all of our different languages but rather according to the situation, according to you know, who we're speaking to, we may use one language or the other, or we may, in the case of my house, you know, I said, I'm Canadian, my wife is from Mexico, our children were born here in the United States, but they are English, Spanish bilinguals. So what language do you think we speak in my house? Well, the language we speak is really Spanglish, right? It's this like mix of, of, of English and Spanish, right? And so which we would typically call like code switching, 
But really, code switching, uh, Ophelia Garcia says, doesn't really capture what's happening with bilinguals, is that really that's part of what we would call their, their linguistic repertoire, right? And so we should think of it then more like a banyan tree. But she says we should also think of language classrooms then, you, extending that sort of metaphor of a banyan tree, um, in terms of multilingualism. And so she says what's a really important um, uh, central, should be a central goal of language teacher education is, as she says, to counteract monolingual ideologies of TESOL. And she says these monolingual ideologies, and this is especially true here in the United States, I'm sure that in the context of Indonesia, this would be different, but at least here in the United States, she says that um, these monolingual ideologies of, of you know, English as the, as the dominant and most important language, um, these are very, very strong, right? And she says that what we should try to do is sort of counteract those uh, ideologies. And she says that really the, the goal for teachers um, thinking of their classrooms through translanguaging would be to try to develop a healthy functional interrelationship between the languages in the school and the classroom, right? So Ophelia and some of her colleagues there have produced some really wonderful materials kind of explaining to teachers, you know, how, how would you do this, right? And these are the kind of materials that, that I use in my classes here at The Ohio State University when we're talking to um, our teacher candidates um, about how, um, you know, to work with multilingual students, right? Or what, what Ophelia Garcia refers to as emergent bilingual students. Emergent bilingual meaning that they are in the process of emerging as, you know, fully bilingual in English and whatever their home language is, right? So this is an example of um, the materials that they have developed, and um, these are um, excellent resources. And we've used this as well in some of the projects that we've done here locally in um, Columbus. This is an example of a, um, a teacher here at what we call a dual language school. Dual language is a particular model for doing um, bilingual education. In, in this case, it's Spanish-English bilingual education. And what the teacher's trying to do is instead of teaching one lesson in English and one lesson in Spanish, she might present the lesson in, in English, but then talk to the kids about the lesson in Spanish. But then if the kid, if one particular student is stronger in English or Spanish, they could answer in a language, right? In whatever language was their, um, in their preferred language. But then maybe they would have to write, you know, uh, make a report in the other language. And so again, what, it's, what Ophelia Garcia is arguing is that instead of thinking of languages in terms of these like rigid boundaries or rigid borders, here's English and here's Spanish, and you have to keep them separated, Again, think about bilingualism in the sense that in a lot of the multilingual communities here in the United States, there aren't those strict boundaries, right? As I said, in my house, we speak Spanglish. We don't think of it in terms of, you know, you have to speak one language or the other language. You use whatever linguistic resources you can to try to communicate your message. My children know, my, my son and my daughter, they know if they're speaking to their grandparents in Canada, they have to speak to them in English because they don't speak Spanish. Likewise, if they're speaking to their grandparents in Mexico, their abuelita in Mexico, well, they have to speak to her in Spanish. So the kids know in some cases, yes, they do have to distinguish the two languages, but at least in our home, they don't have to, right? And so what they're thinking is like, okay, in the classroom, you can also think of it in the same way. In some cases, you might need to, you know, distinguish the languages and sort of try to um, help the students, uh, you know, uh, 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 use the language in, in English or Spanish, like standard English or standard Spanish. But in many cases, it's actually um, much better to be mixing the languages, right? And we shouldn't see language mixing as some kind of a, a deficit. Right? So that's an example of the, um, the work that we've been doing locally. And we've been using this framework from Ophelia Garcia. She talks about translanguaging in three senses, what she calls translanguaging stance, design, and shifts. The stance refers to, again, that sort of like mentality or, or ideology that the teacher has, an ideology of um, healthy multilingualism instead of monolingualism, right? In terms of design, that's the lesson planning, like thinking carefully about how can I organize my lesson around multilingualism, around the home languages or the L1 that my students have. And then shifts are sort of like the moment by moment, those little like, like opportunities that happen in the classroom, what we would call teachable moments that you could kind of use as, um, as a part of your teaching as well, right? And so she talks about that in terms of stance, design, and shifts as a way of how translanguaging can kind of help our thinking. 
And then in some other work I've done with other colleagues, um, Zhong Fen Tian and, and others, um, we've put together this edited volume. As I mentioned, Ophelia Garcia's work is mostly in bilingual education. We've tried to look at sort of how this works in TESOL and also how does it work in lots of different contexts with lots of different models. So as you see here, we've, we've looked at, um, we've asked for um, researchers then to talk about and practitioners to talk about how they use translanguaging to, um, to look at um, uh, English language teaching classrooms in all of these different contexts here. Also in the research now, there's been um, a lot more research in the last, um, you know, 10 years or even five years really about how does translanguaging actually, um, how does it actually work, right, as part of language acquisition. So here's some examples, Velasco uh, and Garcia 2014, that looks at how um, translanguaging can support students' language acquisition. In this case, it's both English language acquisition and Spanish language acquisition, right? So it's um, as a means of um, mediating or supporting scaffolding language acquisition. But also here in the United States, we're looking at it as um, a means of content learning. And so I know in, in um, other places, this is referred to EMI or English medium of instruction. Well, here this is um, what for ESL students, they need to um, use English to acquire the academic content as well. So this is an example of um, a transcript here of a classroom um, uh, described in POSA 2014. It's a science classroom and he's showing again how the students, since they're able to use both English and Spanish to kind of go back and forth um, to in order to able to understand the scientific concepts that they're learning in a um, elementary school classroom. So what I would say then is that um, this idea of translanguaging, um, again, represents a kind of a, a, a shift in our thinking, a shift from monolingualism to what we would call dynamic bilingualism. It represents a, a, represents a shift from thinking of um, the language as a linguistic object to what we would call languaging as a semiotic practice, thinking of language not as a noun, but like as a verb, right? And thinking of um, our what we're teaching, instead of in terms of inputs and outputs, in terms of participation and engagement, um, as well as you see the rest there on, on this chart, right? And so again, it really does represent this shift towards thinking of um, the language, the home languages, the L1s that our students bring to our classrooms, um, instead of seeing them as a source of interference and potential errors in learning English, we think of them as, as a resource and something that we can build upon. And that kind of connects to my second point that if you think about um, language, at the home language as a resource, well, you can also think about, you know, the home culture as a resource, right? We know that language and culture, of course, are, um, are um, intrinsically connected, yeah? So this is what we refer to as culturally relevant pedagogy. You'll see this in different ways. I'm, I'm using the term here, culturally relevant pedagogy was the original term by um, an African-American educator named Gloria, Gloria Ladson Billings. Um, but it's also been referred to as culturally responsive pedagogy or culturally sustaining pedagogy. Um, culturally sustaining pedagogy is sort of an updated version. Um, this is the reference here by um, Paris and Alim, 2017. And so um, there, there are some differences there, but I'm gonna kind of talk about all of these in, in one kind of general sense there. But um, I would refer you to these two um, sources if you're interested. And of course, you know, here in the United States, I'm sure you've heard of, um, you know, amongst everything else that's been happening in 2020 with the, obviously with the, the COVID pandemic and everything else, we've also had um, really an, an awakening um, or, uh, you know, really a movement here towards um, social justice and particularly towards racial justice. Um, if you've heard about the, um, what happened with uh, George Floyd, who was an African-American man who was killed by the police, uh, by, a, by a white police officer here in the United States, and that led to a lot of protests. And so for us here, and especially for us working in education, and I work with teachers in public education, um, this has really caused us to think about like, well, how do we need to um, take, you know, take this message, take the, um, you know, what Black Lives Matter as, as a movement, what these people are, you know, are, are telling us and what we need to be listening very carefully to, um, to that message. And so we're also thinking about sort of how does that impact um, what we're teaching. You'll see an acronym now that's, um, that's quite new, but, but you'll see it a lot here in the United States it's called BPOC. BPOC refers to um, minority um, people here in the US. BPOC means black, indigenous, and persons of color. And so 
for myself, and obviously I mentioned my, my wife is an indigenous woman from, from Mexico, the, um, the, the many of the, the students I work with here in Columbus, we have students obviously from all over Latin America, many students from El Salvador, but also many students from different parts of Africa, particularly, um, particularly from Somalia, but also from Asia, from uh, Nepali um, Bhutanese students. Really, we have a very, um, you know, a lot of different um, immigrants from many different backgrounds here in Columbus, Ohio. And so, again, the, the people that, that myself and, and the teachers that I work with, um, these immigrant families, again, these, these issues um, affect them. Maybe they affect them differently than um, African Americans experience them. But we have to recognize that um, here in the U.S., systemic racism um, is real and it also affects our education system. And so for us in um, English as a second language, um, you know, we're working with many of the, 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 the students and the families who are you know, most vulnerable and most affected by that. And so again, we really need to think carefully about how does our teaching um, you know, reflect the identities and lived experiences of my students and families. And so I would say kind of in a general sense, that's sort of what we mean when we say critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is thinking about these issues of not just sort of how am I going to deliver the content of the curriculum, but also how am I going to do it in a way that recognizes um, the, the, the power relations, recognizes um, racial relations, recognizes things like um, racial or even linguistic um, injustice that exists in, in this country. Um, obviously, we have a, a, a presidential election next week as well, and that's going to um, mean some, some very big changes um, here in the country, either depending, you know, whoever wins the election, um, this is a time that's very politically charged in the country. So we're kind of, you know, obsessing about that here in the United States a lot because we're sort of um, having to look uh, in the mirror very carefully and, and think about, you know, what are our values um, as um, educators here in the United States. And so here's um, a, um, a graphic that I like. And again, um, you, this graphic uses the term culturally responsive teaching. Um, I'm referring to this as culturally um, relevant pedagogy, but same idea, right? And so they say that there's these four components here. There's the components of um, bringing the native language into the classroom, which I think actually really connects to what I was just saying about um, translanguaging. It, it, it um, also connects with the idea of um, family involvement. So again, how do we connect better to the families um, of the students in our schools? And again, for, for particularly for immigrant families where there are language barriers, for us, that, that's, a, that's a really big challenge. Um, but also these other two points here that um, I think are important. Understanding the history and the culture of our students. And again, particularly for students um, here in the United States, the majority of teachers at the elementary level are white and middle class females. That um, makes up uh, more than 70% of the teachers in, in the elementary school. Whereas only about 20% of the students, less than that, are coming from that background, which means most of the teachers in our schools, they do not share the cultural and linguistic background of their students, right? And so there's, there's, there's then this added challenge of, well, how do I connect to the cultural and linguistic background of my students, right? How do I connect to the communities um, where, where I'm teaching again? Because most of the teachers are not from those communities where they're teaching. So I think a really powerful concept for me, at least, that. Um, that I use when I'm working with, with teachers, um, and especially when I'm trying to get them to think about um, culturally relevant pedagogy, is this idea of what's called funds of knowledge. And funds of knowledge is from um, a, 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 a Latino scholar named Luis Moll, and he refers to funds of knowledge as this, um, this idea based on a very simple premise that people are competent, they have knowledge, and their life experiences have given them that knowledge. The funds of knowledge approach is one key to unlock and capitalize on the knowledge that students already possess. So it's this idea that as teachers, we shouldn't just think about you know, the, the, what's in the curriculum and that's the knowledge that we have to impart to the students, but we also have to think about it from the student's point of view of like what knowledge do they already bring and how do I connect the curriculum to the student's background knowledge, right? And I would add, since again, I'm a, I'm a sociolinguist, I would think about again through a, through a language lens and say, okay, well, if there's funds of knowledge, then part of that also must be the linguistic funds of knowledge, right? The lang and this is how I define it, the language resources and practices that learners bring to the classroom based on ways of talking and using language and literacy in their homes and communities. And so again, part of that cultural knowledge is also the ways that, that students use language uh, and literacy in their homes. 
And so we work with teachers then, um, and I'm a, I'm a big uh, proponent of teachers, particularly in um, the public schools and what we call here K-12, from kindergarten to, to high school here in our system, um, to do home visits. Um, nowadays, home visits are usually, we do call virtual home visits. In some way, that's almost better, actually, because, again, um, there's some kind of a, what we would call silver linings to the whole COVID pandemic and the fact that most of us now are doing um, teaching um, and learning like this, like through virtual means, right? So um, when I'm here in, in, in during the day working, my son is in the next room uh, also on Zoom with his teacher um, doing his classes as well, right? And so teachers actually have um, probably more access now, uh, at least in the, in the virtual um, medium, to the students' homes and more opportunities to interact with students' parents. And so what we're encouraging then is to think about these as um, home visits where you as the teacher can learn about your students' families and your students' communities. And so we do um, these kinds of um, you know, uh, interviews for, with the teachers, uh, with the parents, and um, help the parents if we need to translate those interviews into Spanish or Somali or whatever it is to try to help um, facilitate that, um, that communication. And so again, the interviews are about learning Again, what are the language and literacy practices in the home, right? It might turn out that a lot of the, um, I remember in, in one example, the, um, the, the girl she attended, um, she attended church services in her home language in Spanish, and she liked to write stories about Jesus and about the Bible in Spanish, right? And so it turned out that, <coughs> that, the, that the, the church and her Sunday school was a very important source of literacy for her. And she actually did a lot of writing in her home language in Spanish, but the teacher didn't know that. The teacher thought of this student as like struggling in English because her writing in English wasn't very good. But when she realized that she did all of this writing in, in Spanish, it really kind of opened her eyes again to the, um, the, the literacy practices that the, that the girl had um, in her home, right? And so what, um, what I would say here with this is that um, again, this. The funds of knowledge can be anything. It can be anything from the way that the students, you know, are working with their mothers and cooking and learning about recipes to even kids nowadays playing video games <laughs> online. That could be a funds of knowledge. I know there's a whole specialized language around some of these um, these video games, right? And so again, all, any of these things can be um, potential sources of knowledge that we as teachers can connect to um, with our students. And so what it takes is us to use kind of a an anthropological or what I would say ethnographic kind of um, lens here to look at the students' homes and communities, right? To try to, again, to reduce the distance between um, me as the teacher and, my, and the curriculum of the school and the lived experiences of my students, right? And really try to understand how I can engage with the social um, issues related to the students' identities. So here's an example of that. Here's a project that we did um, at a local school, and I was inspired by um, this uh, website, which is a very simple premise. The premise is called, I wish my teacher knew. And what it is, is the students write um, little notes to their teachers about things that the teacher probably doesn't know about them, things maybe that they're struggling with in their lives or things that are important to them in their lives that um, they want the teacher to, to know about or pay attention to, but maybe the teachers just never asked, right? And so here's an example. The student here says, um, I wish my teacher knew that my dad works two jobs and I don't see him very much, right? And so it was little notes like this, and some of them will like break your heart because the, the students are, are, are very honest about um, uh, different things that are happening in their lives, right? With the students that we were talking to, it actually wasn't that so much. It turned out that this group of students that we were talking, um, that we were working with, this is in a second grade classroom here in a, a public school in, um, in Columbus. The students were actually uh, obsessed with the idea of Pokemon. If you know Pokemon, right? Pokemon's this very world famous, a Japanese uh, game about Pikachu. And you know, it's a card game and a television show and a video game, right? And so there's this whole world of, of Pokemon. Well, it turned out that the students actually knew a lot about Pokemon. And I was very surprised. Pokemon is, is very complicated. I mentioned I have a, a son who's 11 years old and he, he's also obsessed with Pokemon. And when we play Pokemon, it's like, I don't really understand the rules. It's like telling me about, well, there's these different types and there's a grass and a water and they have different evolution. I'm like, this is like really, really complicated, right? And it's like a very kind of almost like scientific knowledge that they have about, you know, these different Pokemons. Well, it turned out that these boys 
um, really knew a lot about Pokemon, but in talking to the teachers, the teachers thought the boys were like, you know, they were struggling academically, they were not very engaged in school, and they were not successful um, learners or language learners, right? But it turned out when you were talking to them, if you talked about Pokemon with them, you would have no idea that supposedly, according to their teachers, they were, they were struggling so much, right? So what we decided to do was to try to see if, again, we could kind of bridge between the teacher's perspective of the students as these students as not successful or struggling students and the students themselves who actually were very motivated and very engaged about the things that they cared about, like Pokemon, for example. So what we did was we gave, we got a small um, grant uh, of money to buy these cameras, which are little like disposable cameras. And we gave them to all the kids and asked them a very simple question. What do you like most about your neighborhood? Please go and take the pictures of your favorite things about your neighborhood and then tell us about them. Tell us some stories about what's important to you in your neighborhood. And we got this series of pictures. There's a, what is that? That's a store here in the United States called Target. That's the Target store, like a big, uh, kind of a big shopping center kind of thing, right? And so this little girl, she said her favorite thing was to go to Target with her mother um, and she would get to pick things out. The other kid said, this is my apartments where I live. You can see here in Ohio in the wintertime, it's very cold and full of snow. They said, that's, that's my favorite thing there is playing in my front yard. And here's me in front of my, in front of my house. And we got some very goofy pictures. Here's one of the pictures of the kid playing in his, in his kitchen, right? And so this is what they would say to us. This is um, William is uh, one of the boys. And he said his favorite thing is um, here is the park, playing in the park near my house. And he said what he likes most about his neighborhood is his grandmother. I don't know if that really counts in the neighborhood, but that, that was his answer. So we, we accept that, um, that answer. And we also asked them to like then, um, you know, do a, you know, write some stories about her. If you can't write, you could draw pictures and then tell, tell us about them. And what we did was we made these little videos um, and then shared the videos with the teachers. And the teachers said, you know, they were very surprised. You know, the kids were, were very, um, very genuine, very authentic about um, sharing their, their ideas. Um, here's William again. And he said what he wanted his teacher to know was that anyone can be awesome, be legendary. I think that refers to Pokemon. Is there some legendary Pokemon or something? Anybody can be awesome and be legendary and be smart, even me, he said. Right? So again, we sort of use this as kind of um, an inspiration then for um, you know, getting the teachers to think about, again, how can you connect with um, your students and how can you think of your teaching in terms of culturally relevant or culturally responsive pedagogy. And they even had developed, based on that, a, um, a, a kind of a literacy activity where they had the students and they themselves as the teachers did this. They went out into the community and they took pictures of all the different languages that were represented in their um, in the stores uh, across the community and tried to document um, all the different languages of different foods and different restaurants, different grocery stores, and tried to kind of document the multilingualism and multiculturalism of that and then use that as a basis of, of sort of thinking about how to um, connect with the students in their, in their communities. So that was quite a, a, a powerful activity. All right, so the last trend I would like to talk about um, in the last 15 minutes or so is um, what's called intercultural competence. And so, you know, we've always thought about, particularly in TESOL, we've always thought, again, about this connection between culture and language and how do we best um, integrate culture into um, language teaching. Often this has been sort of, um, you know, traditionally done is what we would call a food and festivities approach to the development of um, intercultural understanding, which is kind of culture at like probably the most superficial level, right? And so here in the United States, it's going to be Halloween very soon. So you would learn about, you know, the customs of Halloween, which again, is nice. I mean, this is certainly something cultural that we do here in the US. But again, it's only kind of very superficial on the level of really understanding what is, you know, what are the cultural practices here, right? And so rather than thinking of it sort of from this superficial food and festivities approach, what we really want to think about is like, how do we understand cultural differences at the level of the actual cultural practices and how people, you know, think in, in the world and relate to each other. And again, I think this is particularly relevant because again, nowadays, as I mentioned earlier, we're moving away from this model in English language teaching of thinking of like the native speaker as somehow the, um, you know, the, the, the goal or the model for, for, for us as, as teachers and thinking about it more in terms of how do I develop the communicative competence of my students um, in learning English as, 
as a global language or English as a lingua franca. There's also a lot of work, of course, you might be familiar with the work in world Englishes as well and looking at like how as English spreads, it also like it doesn't belong to the native speakers anymore. It doesn't belong to their, it's not their language and certainly isn't their, um, you know, cultural norms anymore, right? And so um, the English of um, Indonesia, the English in Singapore, in India, in all these different places in the world, those are their own, you know, perfectly legitimate and valid varieties of English. You don't need to refer to any kind of native speaker in order to sort of legitimize your English, right? And so what, um, what people like um, Seidelhofer and Ketru and other applied linguists who work in this area have been arguing then is instead of thinking about it as a native speaker norm, what we should think about is intercultural communication as the norm for English language teaching nowadays, right? And so what that implies then is thinking about how in our teaching of, of, of uh, English as a second language, how can we move towards building students' intercultural competence? Again, beyond the level of just a sort of superficial um, food and festivities approach to it and sort of to a more kind of anthropological view of culture as, as cultural practices, right? So um, one of the ways of thinking of this is, is this idea of intercultural awareness, right? The awareness of sort of how um, how, you know, how cultural differences then shape, um, shape communication and shape our inter understandings. Or as Baker says, um, his definition is intercultural awareness is a conscious understanding of the role of culturally based forms, practices, and frames of understanding can have in intercultural communication and an ability to put these conceptions into practice in a flexible and context specific manner in real time communication. So that's his kind of like fancy definition of um, intercultural awareness. I would say the other sort of big idea here and where I'm using the, the term, you know, intercultural competence, I think intercultural awareness and intercultural competence, basically the same idea. But um, the model that, that I would suggest here is to, to look at if you're interested in this is by Michael Byram. And Byram's um, intercultural competence model um, is this one here and he bases it on um, five types of intercultural competence and again argues that we should think of intercultural competence as part of the development of students communicative competence again in this sort of more global sense right or he talks about them in terms of um, what he calls savoir these five different um, areas of um, intercultural sort of knowledge that make up intercultural competence so again i would refer you to to that work by michael byron his very important model um, and this is kind of this idea of intercultural awareness or intercultural competence is what we used in a project um, I did down in Mexico. Um, I was invited by the Ministry of Education in Mexico to look at their, um, they have a new uh, English language program for primary school um, in the public schools. So traditionally um, in Mexico, um, English doesn't start until secondary school, but recently they've moved down um, English into the, into the primary grades. And so actually kids now in Mexico start learning English at kindergarten level and they go all the way through um, through high school. So we were invited to um, to do a project to evaluate, you know, how is this program going? And so what I understood then was that like this program in Mexico is sort of part of this sort of larger global trend towards moving English into the curriculum of public primary schools. Um, and this is particularly true in um, Latin America and Southeast Asia as well. Um, in, um, in these areas where, again, the, the idea of, uh, there's sort of an ideology that links um, uh, English language education and teaching English, um, you know, in earlier and earlier age to socioeconomic mobility, to um, global competitiveness of these countries. So it's all kind of part of this, this larger trend as well. But when we were looking at, particularly at the curriculum in Mexico and trying to sort of figure out how do we evaluate this program and, you know, what's successful um, or, or not about the program, the first thing that struck me was, um, this is from the, the curriculum document itself, and they said the goal of the curriculum is, and it says here, is to um, that students will develop the necessary multilingual and multicultural competencies to face the communicative challenges of a globalized world successfully, to build a broader vision of the linguistic and cultural diversity of the world, and thus to respect their own and other cultures. I thought, wow, that's kind of an interesting way of, of like expressing what is the, the purpose of your English, you know, of your, of your English program for, um, for Mexican children, right? And so if we're, if we're trying to evaluate this and how well you're doing, I think again, that this idea of really what that's expressing is the goal of the program is to develop children's or students' um, intercultural competence. 
Excuse right. me, that and was so Sayer. What we tried to do then have... was look about, you know, how do we, how do we document that? How do we see, you know, what's happening? Um, Excuse with me, the children. Dr. Sayer. Again, a lot of these children were very young, as I mentioned, they started in kindergarten. You have so five, five sometimes minutes doing research, left. For those of you that, that do research or work with um, younger children, you know, sometimes, um, you know, that, that can be a challenge in terms of like, how do you, um, how do you figure out what's going Excuse on? Excuse me, with, with Dr. Sayer. Children. I think you have uh, four minutes left for the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to wrap up then. Four minutes, you said, is that correct? Yes, please. Perfect. Thank you. So um, then, uh, what we did was we used this sort of methodology. We, we actually used these puppets, and you can see these are different, um, you know, puppets that the kids would play with, and we um, got them kind of using the puppets then to talk about what they understood were these cultural differences, and you know, they actually surprised us. They came up with lots of different ways that they think um, they understand the, the cultural differences between Mexico and English-speaking countries. Here are all the different ways that they think of, you know, that even like little kids, seven and eight-year-olds. Our understanding cultural differences and it really showed them again that you know kids nowadays really are global citizens right through the media um, and even through their language classes they really are developing this sort of awareness of um, you know cultures and countries and languages all over the world and so again what we were trying to do here was sort of develop this model of how do kids then build these awareness but we were also very um, what we were also noticing with the kids is a lot of times these these, these understandings that were built were based on cultural stereotypes. And so we also wanted to be kind of like careful about, um, you know, we don't want teachers, of course, we don't want to reinforce cultural stereotypes about people and building intercultural competence. It's understanding that, you know, stereotypes often are, um, are incorrect, right? And so here, I think, <coughs> excuse me, the, the implications for, um, for pedagogy, at least working with younger learners of English, was again that we need to balance the linguistic and the cultural elements of the program we also need to have a direct engagement with the cultural content and again going beyond just the food and festivities approach in order to promote um, intercultural awareness and so what we did there was we developed these series of um, teacher training videos um, for the teachers down in mexico and 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 kind of as a way of modeling or sort of scaffolding how they might develop activities that uh, got kids to do these sorts of cultural comparisons, um, again, going to um, these cultural differences at kind of a deeper level. So just to conclude then, I would say these are the, what I see as the three main trends in language teacher um, education here in North America, translanguaging, culturally responsive pedagogy, and intercultural competence. And I mentioned also that you know, where I see kind of the connection between translanguaging and, and culturally um, responsive pedagogy, at least, is through this idea of funds of knowledge. And I would see kind of what links all of them is that we're taking what's um, nowadays a, a sociolinguistic, or often called a sociocultural approach to language teaching. I think that's really kind of what I see as, as the connection there between all of these, all of these different trends. And so, um, just to reiterate then, what I understand by a sociolinguistic or sociocultural approach to language teaching is, first of all, that you use the, the, the student's home language as a resource that can be captured through the idea of translanguaging, that you focus on the student's funds of knowledge, think about this through the idea of culturally relevant pedagogy, and finally then that you um, are thinking of teaching English, uh, global English for intercultural awareness, or thinking about it in terms of building the student's intercultural competence. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sayer, for the very inspiring presentations. And uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you are still in tune with us here in this conference. So, um, well, I believe that there have been some questions, and there are already some questions posted in the Zoom uh, chat, Dr. Peter. So, but we will have the. Uh, question and answer sessions later in after the second speaker presents uh, the uh, uh, does her presentation sorry uh, dear conference participants um, well I would like to remind you again that the chat uh, that you can post your questions to the keynote speakers through the zoom and YouTube channel uh, chat rooms so it is 15 minutes before the 
keynote speaker finish the presentation. So we do not open it throughout the whole time in order to limit the, uh, what is it, uh, the chats there. We have, I'm afraid that uh, it will be covered by some other chats. Well, uh, now we are going to have the second keynote speaker, Dr. Johanna Veniranda. And uh, I would like to read her short bio data. Uh, operator, excuse me, operator, can you share the um, slides, please, about Dr. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Johanna Veniranda? Well, I will read her bio data. Dr. Johanna Veniranda graduated from the English Language Education Study Program, Sanata Dharma University, in 1994. She received her master's degree in English language studies, also from Sanata Dharma University. And in 2009, funded by Presidential Fulbright Scholarship, she pursued her doctoral degree and graduated from the Department of Linguistics and Cognitive Science at the University of Delaware in August 2015. She has been a teaching staff at the English Language Education Sanata Dharma University for the last 25 years, since uh, January 1995, that's quite a long time. And uh, she was uh, the chair of the Language Education Study Program at Sanata Dharma University from 2016 until just last July 2020. Well, uh, in this conference, Dr. Fanny Randa will share her insights about how to enhance students' progress in online speaking classes. So without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Veniranda. You have 40 to 45 minutes for the presentation. Ibu Veni, take your time. All right, good morning, everyone. I think Dr. Sayer is uh, good evening there, right? Or anybody with time difference? Is my voice clear from here? Do I have to speak louder? Okay. Okay. Is it clear now? Okay. So, yes, uh, on this opportunity, in this opportunity, I would like to talk about something. Uh, when I was thinking about what to do or what to present for today, I was thinking about my classes and I'm going to choose w the classes that I think uh, the most uh, challenging for me uh, uh, in this couple of months, yeah, since March actually. Um, so therefore, I, I picked this topic, okay? So how how, yeah, enhancing progress in online speaking classes. Yeah. There are several classes that I'm dealing with this semester, uh, some, theoretical, uh, some theoretical in linguistics, and then some grammar classes, and then there is one translation class. Uh, now I'm going to talk about my speaking classes. It doesn't move. Okay, wait, wait, wait. All right. So, why speaking classes? Why speaking skills? Uh, among the the classes that uh, deals with uh, theories or uh, skills that can be uh, uh, that I can obtain the students' work from written. Yeah, it's, uh, for me, speaking class, classes are the most challenging one. So very different from face-to-face -face classes. And uh, I felt that the previous classes in last semester or last year, uh, things seems very, things seems to run very well already. Yeah, because uh, it's very, uh, when the students are there, I can sp give a, very brief instructions, put them in groups or a lot of activities, card games, board games, or topics, then they will start talking. And I can hear the class is noisy because there are like three big groups and they can like 
uh, uh, start practicing in small groups or at times that I can ask one or two to come forward and then speak to the whole class. So with the situation like online situations like this, and we have limited uh, meetings for Zoom meetings because we have a, a certain kind of policy that we don't really meet on Zoom every week. Yeah, uh, I think about it. Probably starting next week, we can we can do more actually. Um, all right. Why speaking skills? Yeah. Speaking skills involve many language, other language elements. Yeah. So. Uh, when I need to listen to the students speak, then there are a lot of things there. Uh, in, in, in English, as in our context, yeah, it is not used yeah, outside of the class, and with students, very lim uh, with students very limited interaction in this situation, yeah, these things are still there that I uh, need to work on. Yeah, uh, the language elements, their grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary. Yeah, a lot of things are there, and then various aspects for observing oral production. While we are in front of the computer, well, we still want to talk about the clarity. Yeah, with the the volume and the confidence, these things are there. Yeah, the students' facial expressions their hand gestures. Now this is rather hard to get, how to get the eye contact when it is in the classroom. Um, we, can, we can really uh, talk about this. Yeah. And in speaking skills, there is no uh, negotiations about these interactions are essential. So dialogues, uh, discussions to presentations, yeah, interactions are essential. We cannot do without interactions. So even though sometimes it's monologue, yeah, at the end of monologue, we still want to uh, look at the response yeah, and the how, how do the audience uh, view the talk. Yeah, so there, therefore, this is the topic that I'm going to do today. Um, let me, sorry. It's not very loans. Mm. Sorry. My slides are not very fluent. I hope. Uh, uh, wait. wait. Mm. Okay, I'll go back to one slide. So in this presentation, uh, I'm going to talk about, I already talked about this speaking, why speaking classes that I want to focus on. And I'm going to quote some theories yeah, about online speaking classes and functions of speaking skills. And then I'm going to share uh, the class practices that we have in, uh, so far. And I'd like to share a very brief uh, survey from my students, yeah, three classes of speaking classes, uh, their voices, yeah, and then we'll come to some sort of uh, conclusions, yeah. Um, I would like to invite your comments later for the conclusions, okay, so this is already done. Now, I found this article, yeah, the, there is one article when I, I want to look for sources about online speaking classes, yeah, and I come across with this, uh, uh, Hunt, yeah, the third. I think it's 2012. Yeah, so actually, even b before the pandemic uh, outbreak, yeah, people already started talking about online classes for speaking. Yeah, my reason for not wanting to teach public speaking online would be identical to why I do not think yeah, sculpting or playing tennis yeah, should be taught online. Yeah, so uh, it's rather hard. Yeah, meaning that it's 
rather hard. So it's a little bit of pessimistic yeah, about why uh, he doesn't want to teach speaking online. But I come across also some uh, more optimistic voices. Yeah, I, I, I found two actually. Um, Butler and Clark and Jones, yeah, that they, they did research, this is 2017, yeah, about, the, the, about public speaking, actually. And in the research, uh, basically, uh, they, they want to talk some, they want to say that, uh, he wants to say that it's going to work out. Yeah, it's it's going to work out. Speaking can be taught effectively, yeah, even online. And this also the, uh, from Clark and Jones' re, uh, study is also quite uh, optimistic. Yeah, uh, the findings were that. Uh, the student's performance yeah, did not vary significantly between the face-to-face -face classes and then from the online classes. So we, we have voices of uh, op op optimism yeah, that online classes to teach speaking can have the results that are even slightly better yeah, than the face-to-face -face delivery in his research, yeah, in their research. So with some sort of uh, well, looking for this, then I am a little bit inspired also that maybe we shouldn't be too pessimistic. Yeah. So then I'll go to some of this uh, theoretic, theoretical background about teaching, spe teaching speaking skills, actually. There are uh, whether what kind of uh, speaking class that students are to speak in our context, we have to consider the different functions or the, the competence in the particular class that we want to achieve. Yeah? And then this theory uh, from Richards 2008, I'll just quote some, I think these are three uh, divisions of talk uh, or speaking. Uh, functions, very general, but I think it's useful to divide our understanding of what is the purpose of our class. So do we teach speaking as interaction? Teaching speaking as interaction, then it is like uh, teaching our students to converse. It has a social function. Uh, we can lead them to discuss it as uh, formal or casual, and then it's interactive. Yeah, it's conversations, it's interactions, um, follows conversational conventions. Yeah, I think we have a lot of theories about that. So this view, speaking as uh, interaction. The second one is to view uh, speaking as transaction. So there is a certain uh, particular information that we want to focus on. So as long as the message is understood clearly and accurately, then we, we are in a certain context. Yeah, then uh, focusing on the message, for example, in group discussion, in problem, problem solving activities, or asking someone for directions, ordering food, discussing your computer, repair with a technician. So when things are understood uh, accurately and clearly, then we consider this is uh, the message is understood, then speaking is, uh, has a function, uh, the purpose is as transaction. Then the last one is uh, to view speaking or talk as performance. So it refers to public talk with audience. Yeah. For example, classroom presentation, speeches, giving a class report, and usually it is often monologic. Yeah. So it's a monologue. With these three kinds of functions in mind, now I'd like to put this back later 
in my three classes, in my three uh, speaking classes, it is not a clear cut that one of this class is just this, yeah, or one of this class is just this purpose. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a, uh, there can be a possible combination uh, because even it is uh, like in public talk like this with audience, classroom presentation, we usually can make it into a certain kind of transaction because there is going to be discussions, for example. Yeah, so probably by uh, this theory, uh, we can look back, uh, review our speaking class, uh, which one, is it a combination of which and which? Yeah. Or maybe uh, focusing on which? Now, uh, talking about why online speaking classes are quite uh, challenging, I'll also think about uh, there are missing parts yeah, um, from the face-to-face -face classes. Yeah. The facial expressions, the body language, yeah, and we have 3D pictures of the speaker. Yeah, but uh, for these online or virtual classes, we see on the screen, yeah, maybe 2D, yeah, we can say 2D actually is the, in, on, on our monitor, yeah, it's on our monitor. And then the facial expressions, hand gestures, sometimes hand gestures are not really obvious there. Uh, and then the responses and interruptions can be very spontaneous when it is face-to-face -face classes, yeah, easy among multiple speakers, yeah, but when it is online, when, uh, uh, more than three people speaking, probably you cannot hear anything. <laughs> it's very noisy and then like it's rather hard. Yeah, maybe two speakers are fine probably still. And then about talking about these eye contact things, yeah. Actually, um, when it is in class, uh, bigger classes, maybe uh, my students can imagine 1K10 probably or 1K12 probably, in that uh, context, yeah, I'm, I'm going to move around, yeah, I'm going to be on the far left sometimes to check whether uh, I can hear you or I can, you can see me there or I can move to the far right, yeah, and I would like to see whether you're talking to one of your friends at the front only or you can reach uh, looking at your friends at the back, yeah, something like that. Well, for eye contact with the online classes, yeah. Well, you have to look at where is the camera, yeah, where is the camera. Um, then when you're speaking to the camera, probably your audience can feel that you're speaking to them. Yeah. Um, when you're not really sure where the camera is, probably uh, you're looking at the ceiling, probably looking at the wall, then, then probably your audience can, cannot feel that you're looking at them either. So at least your eyes are fixed to the front, right? Uh, if you are going circling around the room, probably, yeah, but you need to go back to the camera. And then about voice projection. So uh, when it is in class, yeah, uh, because we are preparing, uh, we are uh, we call them uh, teachers to be or uh, practice teachers. Yeah, we really want to make sure that the the voice can really reach the, every corner of the class. Yeah, so it's a kind of practice where uh, this is not done. The pro the voice projections are not uh, loud enough. Then it's very easy for our friends to remind the speaker we cannot hear you. But with this online, then uh, yes, we can ask you to speak louder. Yeah, louder of how loud? Yeah, when the speaker is, uh, the mic is good. Probably, I think if I speak this loud in a classroom of one K ten, probably my students cannot hear me at the back. Yeah, but fortunately, this with this mic is working uh, fine, so the volume might be just okay, right? So the devices uh, that involves in our uh, uh, online class, that is the computer, 
the mic and the speakers are the parts that are important. Uh, but the basic motto that we will never get tired of listening to it or using it, that whatever, ma uh, whatever um, we are doing, for our classes, we have one thing in mind, that practice makes perfect. And we improve speaking by speaking. So in our head as teachers, when we are dealing with uh, speaking classes, in our mind, in our head, what am I going to make my students do? Okay, And here in this case, how am I going to make my students keep on practice speaking? Yeah. Even though they are from Sumatra, from Kalimantan, from, uh, from the eastern part of Indonesia, at this moment, yeah, my students are in their hometowns. Some are in western part of Java, central Java. Some are in Jogja nearby. Yeah. But how can I make sure yeah, I cannot visit them? Okay that they are doing what they are supposed to practice, yeah? They are doing what they have to do. So far in my classes, yeah, we have been using this media, uh, this um, way to communicate, to build interactions, yeah? Zoom meetings, which is provided, which are provided, uh, the accounts are provided by the university, and since it is licensed, then we can this we can have these break rooms, yeah, break rooms for smaller group discussions, yeah. And then a very handy uh, uses of WhatsApp group video call with a small groups of uh, four, yeah, three or four members. This has been also uh, very useful for uh, so far. And then I I did this, yeah, for uh, WhatsApp video calls video call for with one student for uh, the test actually yeah for a conversation yeah just face to face uh, these are all the efforts to build interactions and then other things uh, how to make the students practice we assign audio files yeah uh, these are discussion with my some of my colleagues yeah who are teaching uh, public speaking yeah we target at uh, the students uploading uh, around eight audio files. Yeah. So far we have done four. Yeah, I've assigned four of them with various kinds of topics. And then in sometimes to, to not to keep on uh, using a Zoom where uh, some students have problems with the connection, then we also have these voice messages. Yeah, so students press the button and then speak, and then other friends can. Uh, we play games on this actually uh, with one of the classes. Yeah, with one of the classes, but I didn't play with all the three classes that I'm dealing with this semester. And then, yeah. So uh, for the upload, uh, for the uploaded files, in addition to audio files. I would like to also, or we would like also to see our students' overall body language, eye contact with the camera, actually, not with the, uh, assuming that is also with the audience. Uh, this is one of the, the things that uh, we do. So the students uploaded their uh, video, five minutes, yeah, uh, four to five minutes, uploaded it, and then share the link to our WhatsApp group. So we can have 24 students here. I watched them all already, take notes of them. We are going to discuss it next week. Yeah? Uh, and I assign students to watch their friends. And then, so this student, the first student is going to watch the, the next five. And he's, uh, he's going to, or he or she, she's going to uh, write comments on, uh, the YouTube comments part, a slot about what went well and other rooms for improvement. So constructive uh, comments on the YouTube comment slots. Yeah, so, and then the next student will comment on the next five 
and then it follows. So everybody comments on five, then everybody will finally receive at least five comments. So this, their friends will also confirm what are their strengths and what they still need to work on. This is one of the activities that we are trying to uh, do. And then uh, I had a opportunity to uh, give out questions to my students, and I re I'm really grateful that they, they really uh, give very quick uh, reply, and they're really willing to do it like uh, days ago. Um, it contains like reflection and then feedback and suggestions. So let's listen to uh, their voices. Yeah, actually, this is uh, how. So um, I'm really glad that actually I have 66 students. Yeah, and then 60 respond, uh, 60 responses. Yeah, there are there were 60 responses. And there are three speaking classes, yeah, topical conversations in the extension course. Uh, there are semester two students with various, various backgrounds. And then critical listening and speaking one for semester three PBI students. And then public speaking semester five, uh, the English language education study program students also. So this is the composition. Uh, this is the first question that I ask. Uh, which of the following activities do I find most challenging? Then most efforts are required. Then uh, we have done so far uh, some, uh, the video is for the test actually, actually for the semester three and five students. And then we also uh, had this recording, yeah, audio recording. And I also asked the students to work in groups of three to four uh, with the assumption that they can work uh, through the group uh, WhatsApp call, but I would like them to record the discussion. Yeah. So the first, yes, the efforts required for the monologue, yeah, the presentation, the public speaker uh, presentation, uh, like uh, with the audience, is uh, the majority has this, and the second uh, recording audio. So the students, uh, the majority of the students also consider that even recording the, the audio file requires efforts, yeah, that is, uh, that is quite, quite uh, challenging. The next question, I'm asking them which activity that they feel they, quote unquote, yeah, they are forced to perform their best as evidence of their practice. Yeah, uh, still the majority consider that the video is the one that uh, forced them to perform their best yeah, because all aspects are there. But we can also, we can also see that some students also find uh, uploading an audio file yeah, where the teacher cannot see them is also challenging. And then attending a Zoom meeting for a presentation for them, is also challenging. Yeah, so these are three the big uh, three big uh, uh, activities that they co they consider will force them, what in course force them to perform their best. Then this question, yeah, in this situation where uh, resources are limited. Okay, thank you. Um, it turns out that activities with the record, the audio recording is considered the most helpful. So students feel that this one is challenging and it's the most helpful. And uh, as, many, as many audio files uh, are assigned, for them it's helpful. Yeah. So I would, I would like to, to see this as uh, actually, uh, a very, a very uh, useful information from, uh, is very useful information for me also. Then uh, the situation, how the students do, maybe I can skip this if uh, later you have questions. Yeah, I asked them how many times they practice before they record their audio files. Yeah, so the majority is three to four times. Yeah, some 30% do it 
more than six times, yeah. And also with video, yeah, six times, more than six times. Very good. Now, this one is probably surprising because I didn't really uh, break rooms into small groups with our Zoom meetings. Uh, I think I did it like uh, once in every class, yeah, and then maybe twice in one or the two classes, yeah. So the majority, 70% of the 60 respondents said that break rooms are better to practice for our Zoom um, meeting. And then uh, the next questions where I asked about whether videos are uh, videos that, they, that I asked them to watch from YouTube, yeah, so it's not from me, are uh, useful, yes, useful. What about uh, how-to videos from YouTube, useful, very useful. And then about comments on language accuracy for, s for their uh, speaking performance, very useful. And then drilling of certain sounds where students, uh, where we don't have these sounds in Indonesian language, for example, do they find it useful when the teacher comments on their uh, s uh, sound production for this? And the majority find it useful. Pronunci pronunciation drill for specific words, even word stress, useful, yes. And then there are a lot of, um, uh, I asked them to choose three that they consider most useful. So number one is uh, yeah, finding relevant videos for them to watch, to have a role, for them to have a model probably because we have limited time to meet in uh, Zoom meeting. And then the second one is Zoom meeting in small groups. Yeah. And then about what do they expect to improve? Yeah. So students, I'm glad that they actually are aware that they need to improve their accuracy. Yeah. And the second one is about the contents and organization of ideas. Yeah. Okay, so I've, uh, these are uh, some uh, useful videos. Uh, some useful videos and this, uh, ETJ English, um, uh, I, I, I pick one of these TH sound, the th sound, and I send it to all the classes in my uh, speaking classes. And then I found, I came across with this very, uh, very good uh, pronunciation teacher, yeah. Uh, teaching word stress and then pronouncing certain similar words, yeah. So I, f I came across with this very useful, yeah. I send it to all students of all classes. Okay, so I'd like to close uh, my my uh, presentation with uh, teachers will do this kind of uh, reflection that for teaching speaking classes online, yeah, how much learner talk is there in comparison to teacher talk? So we, because we don't have much time, our minds should uh, focus on uh, how am I going to make my students talk a lot or practice a lot. And then various kinds of interaction, whether in pairs, whether small groups, and sometimes in the whole, whole class as a group. And then um, even exploring familiar topics, but also the opportunity to explore uh, uh, probably unfamiliar topics. Yeah, they, they can have a uh, small research to look for information about it. And then as a, a community, as a class, then we also want to make sure that the learners can learn from others and then they have their contribution and then their respect to others, uh, to others' presentations. Then I'd like to take some of the conclusion here, even though probably uh, 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 my colleagues uh, can have also at some more, so different classes of course have different focus in purposes. Similarities among online speaking classes, yeah, student, students expect, so I, 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 I mean here like uh, for the different speaking classes for different semesters, there are similarities about the online speaking classes that the students expect interactions and they like to practice in smaller groups yeah, rather than bigger groups. Maybe as uh, at the end of the product, like at the end of the, 
uh, some progress tests, probably we put them in bigger groups, yeah, but they like to practice in smaller groups. And then in this situation, it turns out that online sources that are relevant to our classes are unbelievably resourceful and we can make use of them. We can invite a lot of experts to our, cl uh, our class, yeah, and f they are present for our students. For our context, students need feedback for their language accuracy also. Yeah. I think forget about the high five for a moment. Yeah. Let's do this for some more time, okay? <laughs> Hang in there. Yeah. So thank you. I'll give the time back to Butri. Thank you, Butri. Okay. Well, thank you, Bufeni. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are now coming to the uh, question and answer session. Um, there are several questions already posted in the chat room for uh, uh, Dr. Sayer and also for Dr. Feni Randa. So I would like to give the first uh, opportunity to Dr. Sayer to uh, answer the questions. Uh, there is a question. There are some questions, and the first one comes from Dr. Combs. So uh, he was asking about uh, well. He could see that the approach to language teaching should work well in the U.S. context, uh, but then. He was wondering how translanguaging works in a foreign language context, such as in Indonesia. And uh, well, Dr. Sayer, can you take the time to answer the question, please? Yeah, thank you. Are, are you hearing me okay now? Is the, the sound is okay? Yes, very clear. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the, the question there. And I think it's, it's one that we get a lot because, um, as I mentioned, uh, the origin or the genesis of translanguaging is from bilingual education here in the U.S. and particularly, you know, in Spanish English context where both the teacher and the students um, uh, share the, 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 the languages, right? But you're right. The question is, what about in multilingual context? Um, and certainly in, you know, a place like Indonesia, which has um, hundreds, thousands of different languages, you guys are in a very highly multilingual context. But I also mentioned that here, you know, in my context here in Columbus, um, oftentimes in English as a second language classrooms, we have, um, we might have seven or eight different languages in the same classroom from, as I mentioned, Spanish or Somali, Nepali. Um, we have lots of different uh, languages there. And so of course the teacher doesn't, share, doesn't necessarily know all of those languages. And so how do you use translanguaging in a way then if you don't you know, have, uh, know all of the languages of your students. And so that's what I was um, mentioning, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll put a link for the book that we just did here in the, um, in the, in the chat. But um, that was kind of what we were looking at through that example of um, what I called envisioning TESOL through a translanguaging lens, which was really that kind of exploration of how do you use the concept of translanguaging in these multilingual um, in these multilingual contexts. And so in that case, um, the, 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 the person who's asking the question, there, there's the link there in the chat, by the way. The person who's asking the question is exactly right. You can't use it in the same way that I was saying of like design or stance necessarily, because as a teacher, again, you, you, don't, you don't have that as part of your linguistic repertoire. But I do think though that the, the, at the level of sort of the, the perspective or the ideology, the approach of the teacher and sort of understanding the students' languages or home languages as a resource, I think that's still an important insight that we can use um, as educators and sort of understanding again that the first language isn't a barrier or isn't a source of interference, but rather that it's a resource that we as teachers can use. And even if I myself don't know the language of my students, but if I create a sort of environment within the classroom that says that you as the student, you can use whatever ling linguistic resources you want in order to try to um, you know, meet the challenge of acquiring English. Um, and again, our goal is still to try to help students learn you know, the standard variety of English, for example. But again, it's a way of, of thinking of it from, um, you know, rather than seeing the first language as a deficit or a barrier that has to be overcome, we're looking at it as a resource that, that helps to bridge the student to get there. 
So you're right in, in terms of, you know, sometimes the, the teachers um, limited by their own linguistic knowledge. But again, I think creating that environment and again, thinking about how do we create um, different opportunities. One example I think of was a, a high school teacher here in a, in a um, science classroom in the United States asked the students to do like brainstorming first um, amongst each other in their home language and then to talk about it and present it in English and then they could go back to the home language to sort of take notes and sort of understand what what the other classmates were saying but then to try to produce these PowerPoint presentations in English and so again I think the idea with translanguaging there is is sort of instead of thinking of the you know the, the borders or sort of the the boundaries between the languages again sort of helping students to think about how can they part of developing um, linguistic fluency is also sort of being able to move back and forth um, amongst the languages. And so I guess that that was sort of the, the way I would answer that question is sort of, again, it's, it's, it's not just um, pedagogical strategies, but also kind of like the, the mindset or the mentality that we as teachers think about uh, multilingualism. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sayer. And I think uh, Mr. Oda's and um, Ms. Agnes' questions are also similar to uh, the one posted by uh, Mr. Kons. And uh, well, I think uh, we can proceed to the next question, which is uh, from, uh, oh yes, uh, I think uh, we, you, uh, we want you to answer Ris Ms. Riska's question, more specifically. Uh, asking about uh, in non-native English-speaking countries like Indonesia and students are required to pass particular standardized tests to measure this English competency. How does translanguaging facilitate students to acquire their English competency? So uh, this is uh, Ms. Rizka's question. So Dr. Sayer? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, and again, this is where I would say that the goal of our teaching is still often to try to help students acquire the um, standard varieties of the language. And again, as a sociolinguist, I would remind us that, you know, all of us are speakers of dialects, right? So even though, you know, my dialect might be closer to the standard variety, but the standard itself is just another dialect, right? There's nothing sort of better or worse about um, uh, a, a standard dialect versus a vernacular dialect, right? But but you're, the question is, you, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of as, as language teachers, our goal then is to help students to master that dialect, which is considered, you know, the, the, the standard. Because again, they have to take tests in that. That's what they'll need for higher education. Again, this is, this is kind of um, why, why the standard exists, because it gives the students access to all those other kinds of possibilities. And so you're absolutely right that, um, you know, whether, whether you, you adopt a, a translanguaging perspective or not, that, that still remains the goal. But what does it mean if you adopt a translanguaging perspective in terms of getting towards the standard? Um, again, as I said, like uh, within a translanguaging perspective, we're, we're sort of suspicious of the fact that the standard isn't, you know, in, in, in linguistic terms, any better or worse than any other, any other dialect, right? But I would say, you know, if you think about, you know, to use a, a metaphor, if you're in um, Indonesia and you're in uh, Surabaya, for example, and you're trying to get to Jakarta, again, what are your possibilities to get from Surabaya to Jakarta? Well, you could, you know, drive across the whole, um, the whole island, the whole country. You could take a boat maybe, or you could fly, right? And what's the best way to get there? So again, if you think about if by, by, by analogy, is it better to use a translanguaging approach or is it better to use a multilingual approach, right? Well, if you think about getting from one side of Indonesia to the other, the best way to get there, well, it might depend on, you know, is it the cheapest way? Is it the fastest? If there's bad weather, maybe a different route is better, right? And so again, the idea of translanguaging is to understand that there's not only one way to get from point A to point B. There's not only one way to get students to acquire English, uh, the standard variety of English. But rather, we should understand that the students, again, come with lots of different language and cultural resources. And so our job as teachers is not to prescribe only one path for them, but to rather to try to understand, you know, that each student might have a slightly um, different um, path to get there. But again, that, that path will, um, will be the best one for them, right? And so again, I think that, that what translanguaging tries to do is emphasize the flexibility that we as teachers need but also to try to understand it from the student's perspective and the home language resources that they have. But again, that doesn't mean that, you know, again, our ultimate goal is to try to help to get them to 
acquire um, uh, standard English, right? So, yeah, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And thank you for the question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sayer. And uh, we have a question posted uh, in the YouTube channel. Uh, this question comes from Ms. Lorenzia Sumarni. So, uh, it is really in uh, your, Dr. Sayer, your presentation is very enlightening. And Indonesia is a multilingual and multicultural. However, the language teaching approach is still monolingual, where English is the means at the end of the language learning and ignoring the potential of the first language as resources and also scaffolding and leverage for foreign language learning. And the multilingual turn in language education and translanguaging are new concepts in Indonesia. So the question is, can you suggest some of the practical ways that we can do to start the great shift in the language education. So, Dr. Sayer, that's the question. Uh, yeah, thank you for the, the question. I don't know if I have a, a really good answer for that because, again, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm representing what's happening here in, in North America, but again, I don't know the Indonesian context. For me as a sociolinguist, Indonesia is one of the, probably the most fascinating places in the whole planet because in Indonesia you have the highest degree of linguistic diversity and linguistic richness in the whole planet, right? And so I think by definition, um, uh, Indonesia as a country is like the maximum, um, uh, you know, dream for people who think about um, language diversity, right? And so I think from that perspective, I think, um, yeah, potentially translanguaging could be a very rich concept uh, for everyone in Indonesia to think again about how we could um, use the multilingualism and the language the richness of language diversity that you have in the country um, in our language classrooms. But you're right, a lot of times, um, and I think the same thing to, to a lesser extent is, is true in, in Mexico, where there are many different um, languages, including uh, indigenous languages spoken. But again, still, we tend to think about um, the teaching of English only in that monolingual sense, right? Only in the sense of you need to only use English and try to forget about all the other languages. So I think from a practical point of view, that's kind of the challenge uh, I would say, you know, uh, suggest to you guys as teachers is to think about, you know, what then would be the strategies if I have students coming from lots of different backgrounds, I have students who are already bilingual in Javanese and Indonesian or from Bima or from all sorts of different places, and they're already bringing this, 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 um, these, these linguistic resources, these multilingual resources, well then, yeah, what does that mean? What do I do in terms of understanding that um, my students are already multilingual? And so adding English is, again, it's a, it's a very unique challenge because again, as, as, as um, English is not um, you know, one of the, 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 the quote unquote native languages of Indonesia. But again, I think that, that poses that, that challenge for us in sort of thinking about how in my, in my own teaching, in my own pedagogy, how could I incorporate my students' home languages there um, and, and particularly, you know, if you have students that are coming from, you know, different multilingual backgrounds like you probably do, in, you know, in the major cities. So, again, I don't know if that's um, a really good answer to the question, but I would say, again, for me, coming from the United States, it's not, you know, I, I, I don't, I think it would be very, um, like, presumptuous of me to try to prescribe, here's how you should do translanguaging Indonesia. I think, again, if, if the concept is there and that, that would be kind of locally, then how would you appropriate the idea of 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 um, translanguaging and use it in your own um, in your own teaching. There's a um, a Sri Lankan uh, scholar uh, applied linguist named Suresh Kanagaraja who's here in the United States now, but he's originally from from Sri Lanka, and he talks about this idea of appropriation and how can we appropriate these concepts from applied linguistics and from um, English language education in a way that fits for the local context, right? In a way that is, so that translanguaging is now, uh, you know, if you wanted to use it and appropriate it, it's not an American concept anymore, it needs to be an Indonesian concept. And so I guess I would put the question back on, 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 um, on you guys as, as language educators in Indonesia to think about like, you know, what are the applications or implications for it in, in your own context? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, yes, context is indeed very important in order to, uh, what is it, uh, use this kind of concepts later. And I think this is a good moment for us later to discuss together in, in, the, in our context in Indonesia, Dr. Sayer. And I uh, would like to present you with one more question before uh, 
we come to Bufeni to answer the questions. And I think it is a little bit related with uh, what Bufeni has uh, presented. It is about the how would uh, would you like, sorry, this is sorry, from Ermina, from Ms. Ermina, MPD. So uh, she would like to ask how to grow the student's confidence to speak in English in class while the student's environment does not support it. So maybe she imagined that, uh, okay, in, in uh, some different places, different contexts, then the students are not supported with the uh, English environment. So uh, that is the question from Ms. Ermina. Dr. Sayer. Yeah, thank you, Ermina, for, for the question. Um, and again, I think it's if you can find out, you know, what, what um, the students are interested in, and we think about, you know, motivation as, you know, as the, as the key to a lot of things. And so I think that that motivation is, 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 um, is right. But I think thinking about motivation in the way that um, there's another applied linguist named Bonnie Norton. And Bonnie Norton says, like, let's not call it motivation, let's call it investment. Like, what are the investments that students have in learning a language? And part of that investment is sort of also how do they how do they want to use the language for their own purposes, right? And so one example I can think of um, comes from uh, some of the teachers that I was working with. There, there was an ESL teacher here in Ohio who was telling me about a student who was very, what she called, low motivation, right? The student was not interested in her class. Who his attendance was a problem. She could never get him to speak in class. She thought maybe he had a problem of like, you know, maybe his English was kind of low, but it was also maybe she said maybe a lack of confidence or maybe he, she really just didn't like the class, didn't want to participate. And so what she was trying to think about, like, well, what are different ways I can get this student named Juan? What are the different ways I can get Juan to like participate in class? What she realized was Juan's passion, what he really loved was skateboarding. You know, skateboarding was like, you know, going around and on that little, uh, that little apparatus and doing all these crazy tricks on skateboarding. And she saw him talking to his friends in English, right, um, about skateboarding. And she realized, wow, he's like, he actually speaks more English than I thought. At least when he's talking about skateboarding, he suddenly, you know, seems to be a lot more fluent. When he's in my class, he like, I can never get him to say anything. And so what she did was she gave him a project and she said, your homework now, if you want to, you know, if you want to get a good grade in my class, because he was like practically failing the, the class. She said, I want you to make like a, a YouTube video. She, he said that he, often they would make these skateboarding videos on YouTube, right, where they would do some trick and then they would post it on YouTube. She said, OK, your assignment is to do a tutorial about skateboarding and put it on YouTube and you have to narrate the video in English and explain how do you do some trick. And she said that when uh, at the end of the week, when she asked Juan, did you post your video, show me the video? He said, yes, but I didn't do a video. I did five videos. And he posted all of these videos about all of these skateboarding tricks. And she said she was so impressed with his English and also like how carefully he had worked and how hard he had worked on these skateboarding videos. She said he never got him to work that hard on the, on the, the actual class itself. But again, when she found that there was something that he was passionate about and gave it in a way, again, that would try to, you know, lift up his confidence instead of making him speak in front of the group, which he hated to do, she allowed him to do it through the use of video. And that was something that, again, connected to his own interest. And that was a way that, um, that could inspire his confidence in his own um, English speaking ability. Okay, thank you. So uh, now I think, uh we would like to have uh, Dr. Fenny to answer some questions. And the question comes from Ms. Demisari Harmades from EIN Patu Sankar. And uh, she was wondering about uh, your experience in assessing the speaking online. And also, I would like to give the second uh, question. This is from Ms. Isti. In relation to teaching speaking, with the trend now being on world Englishes, do you think do you refer to a particular variety of English, and what are the rationales for the choice? So, uh, Ibu Veni, that's okay. Our thank questions. you uh, for Ibu Demisari. Uh, I think it's the same question with Ibu Triana. Actually, it's about assessing, assessing. Um, online speaking classes. 
uh, it's just the same like we when we when we have uh, a class a face to face class actually for assessing speaking we will still use a rubric yeah rubric to uh, that we consider as our priority for our students at that level yeah so if uh, if it is in a lower level, probably, yes, fluency, that they, they speak uh, uh, quite mu uh, many English words, then we are very happy already, right? So the rubric for the level that is uh, appropriate for that level is the, uh, the, the teacher's decisions, yeah. And then to do that, teachers need to make sure that we have sufficient uh, sample of their students' talk. So. If you uh, ask students to, to upload an audio file of three minutes, I think as a kind of a, like progress test, then you, you have enough samples for to measure the clarity, uh, the pronunciation, the fluency, the organizations of ideas. Yeah? So you can decide, so it's the teacher's uh, decision to to highlight what's important for that level. Yeah. So in your class, the process, the activities, what have you done so far? Then you want to tell your students. Yeah. So whatever you want, to, um, you want to focus, you, you will tell your students yeah, that if this is an impromptu speech, for example, then yeah, it's okay to have some pauses to have so the fluency probably is second yeah but if it is a prepared speech you will also want to tell your students that you put fluency uh, as part of the very important aspect in your evaluation or for uh, since uh, I'm dealing with semester uh, two three and five of course I put different kinds of um, priority yeah, I put different kinds of uh, level of expectations. Yeah. For like semester five, of course, I would like to tell them that yes, because the test is, uh, I'm going to assess your prepared speech. This is not impromptu speech. So please prepare. If some students come as like, as if it is an impromptu speech, of course then other students who are already really well prepared, then of course the, their fluency will be better. So that is to answer Ibu Demisari and Ibu Triana about assessing. So it's the teacher's decision to, to decide the rubric. Yeah? You want to focus on the, uh, which one, yeah, which one? Is it clarity? Because it is, uh, you want to tell your students that they need to make sure that their recording is clear. They need, they need to replay it first before they send it to you. If it is not very clear, you can ask them to redo actually because you, you want them to do well and you, want to, you don't want to uh, give uh, lower, uh, lower grades just because the, the recording is not good. Yeah? So uh, that's what I can say. So the rubric is a teacher's decision. I think that's it, Putri, thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much, Ibu Fenny. Uh, there are more questions which are actually similar. So it comes from Ms. Ati Herawati, Universitas Pakuan, I suppose. Unpak is supposed to be Universitas Pakuan. Please forgive me if, forgive me if uh, I'm wrong. So Ibu Fenny, when you taught speaking, did the students interpret correctly the instruction given online? Or are there cases of misinterpretation? That's the first. And then uh, there are also some questions related with accuracy and fluency coming from Fauz um, Mr. Osep Fauzan and also from Ms. Faradila Angi Fajri. So it is related with uh, accuracy and fluency. Which one is more important? Is it accuracy or fluency? And uh, when we uh, see it from the student's perspective, 
which one do the students prefer? Feedback on accuracy or fluency? Well, Bufeni? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's back, uh, it's uh, going back to our uh, priority or our decision of uh, telling the students whether, w which one we want to put forward, yeah. And I think Bapak Ibu also have their, your, your uh, uh, considerations uh, according to the level, yeah. For students, uh, like I also have different, different priority, like if I, when I'm dealing with semester one students, yeah, fresh graduate from senior high school students, I would just, fluency would be, as long as they speak, they make, uh, they produce as many words as possible in one minute, for example. I'll tell them, yeah, you just speak. What, uh, what ideas that come to your mind, tell us, yeah, so I will grade your, how many words that you can, uh, you can express, yeah, so for semester one, for example. But I would like to tell my semester five students that I'm going to get both, yeah, so I'm not going to ask you to just keep on talking and then for five minutes just keep on uh, talking, uh, but be careful with your language, yeah. So if you are doubtful about certain pronunciation or words, check it in the dictionary. You learn about phonetic transcription. You want to, this is a prepared speech, so you want to, uh, you want to uh, really prepare from all aspects. So that's what I can say. I think for fluency for teachers at the lower level, uh, I, I'm really into the drilling thing, yeah, for uh, maybe for jun uh, junior high school students, senior high school students, or even for lower semester, like semester one, two, yeah. Uh, drilling for the students to uh, repeat after the teacher, yeah, can be words, can be phrases, and can be challenging, like more longer, uh, like longer sentences than um, drilling. So the students repeat after the teacher. Yeah, I think uh, Bu Tri, I, I skipped one question from the previous session that is from Bu Isti. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think about word English. Yes, yeah, maybe I would like to address that one also. Which one do I prefer, American English or uh, British English? Yeah. Uh, well, as long as it is uh, the inner circle of English that uh, I think we at the, the English Language Education Study Program, we would like our students to speak uh, the English that is uh, uh, possible for them to communicate in like formal conference like this probably, uh, in a, a formal s a presentation, yeah. Even though we talk about word Englishes, maybe after that they will go back to their original um, dialect with a, a very strong uh, mother tongue. But when we talk about what to teach, yeah, we would like to teach the, the inner so called English, yeah. When you open the dictionary, the Cambridge dictionary, you have the two versions of pronunciation. It's American English or British English. That so far that we have uh, the, all the online dictionaries, yeah, we can click the, sp the speaker and then it's going to give us the pronunciation of either British English or American English. And we want to tell our students that you speak either of them, either of them for me, because my uh, pronunciation lecturers 30 years ago uh, requires us to, s to speak British English then uh, we, we miss a lot of R. <laughs> so probably uh, my friends who, who prefer American English. But I would like to tell my students that choose one of them, okay? Uh, or maybe sometimes mix up. Mix probably, uh, some, I forget, is this British this one or American this one? Uh, why? Uh, you don't want your students to speak neither. <laughs> neither. Uh, it's neither. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the English that you can uh, look for. But in our classes, we also introduce uh, speakers of English from other other uh, nationalities. Yeah, we show uh, speakers of English from uh, Korea, yeah, from uh, India, 
from uh, Singapore. Yeah, so yes, we introduce word Englishes uh, to our students, but of course, when we want to teach, then we want to teach the, the one from the inner circle. I, I can say that. Yeah, uh, uh, you are going to pronounce this this word as uh, present, and then. Uh, present if it is an adjective and you are not going to create a new version okay not going to create a new version that is not uh, the the conventional way of to present is the verb uh, being present is the adjective right so you, if you are going to say I don't know how to create a new word here yeah. so uh, do not create uh, something that is probably uh, you, you assume people will understand you, yeah, but in our class, in our the learning process, we would like to uh, focus on what is what is uh, of the inner circle. Yeah, probably my friends from Australia can also uh, have their, uh, they want to teach us their versions. Yeah, okay, we can learn, yeah, we can learn. And then the decision actually uh, will be for the students to decide. As long as it is uh, the one that, that it uh, that that is what's right, that we can use uh, for formal and the, not the one that we create on our own. Yeah, so we don't want to create a new version where when when you speak, uh, people will have to uh, think about it for a while. Yeah, keep on uh, have to pause and think for a while. What is that? Okay, you read it. You say it like the spelling, probably, yeah, something like that. So that's uh, what I can say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ibufeni. Well, I think we still have about uh, five minutes or so, and uh, I think I missed one question, Dr. Sayer. This is from Ms. Nina Suryandari. I think I missed that question, and I th and this question is very interesting, I think. So uh, a lot of time when we are using a certain approach, we forget to tell the students why we use that approach. And this including using translanguaging in our classroom. The question is how much do you think we need to tell the students why we let them to use other languages when they discuss in group and try to use English in a bigger group discussion? Dr. Sayer, if so uh, would you please answer the question? Yeah, thank you, Nina, for that question. Um, yeah, as far as how explicit should be should we be with the students about you know this is the approach I'm using or this is why I'm doing this? I mean, some of it might depend on the age or you know the area that the students are in, right? And so, um, but I do think it's important to um, again, especially if you're using an approach like translanguaging, where the whole point of the approach is to create uh, an environment, or as Li Wei would call these, translanguaging spaces. And so you want your classroom then to have the sense that this is a space where all, all and any languages are welcome and all and any languages are legitimate and uh, validated, right? And so again, whether or not you would tell the students this is called translanguaging and this is why I'm doing it, Again, that might depend on um, on on you know the, the the particular age or or context where you're in. If it's younger students, again, you can create that environment for them just by again showing them that like if they would respond in the language and be like, oh wow, that was really good. Okay, that's an excellent idea. Thank you so much. How would we say that in English? And just by giving them the sense that you are um, you know that you are really um, interested in validating their their response in whatever language. If I'm working with older students, and particularly, you know, when I was working in Mexico, it was with students who were going to become English teachers themselves, right? They, these were um, uh, BA students in a TESOL program. So in that case, I would be very explicit um, about, um, you know, explaining to them this is the approach I'm using because they themselves are going to become English teachers in the future, right? And so again, whether or not you would explain to the students this is this is called translanguaging and this is why I'm doing it or whether again you would do it in a more like implicit way but again trying to give them that very strong sense of um, the positive sort of multilingual environment that you're trying to create again i would say that kind of depends on you know what the, the particular age of the students and, and who your students are 
Okay, thank you very much. Well, dear conference participants, uh, I believe that you still have more questions to the speakers, but I think we have approached the time limit for this session, and uh, Dr. Sayer has provided his link at the Zoom chat. I think uh, he is willing to uh, be contacted through that link. And uh, thank you for Dr. Peter Sayer and Dr. Veniranda for your time to share your expertise, your insights and ideas in this conference. And I would like to highlight what Dr. Sayer has mentioned, that there has been a shift in the landscape of language education in North America especially. And there have been three recent trends in um, influencing language teacher education programs. The first is translanguaging, second is cultural relevant pedagogy, and the next one is intercultural competence. And I think his presentation have given us some new insights on how we, yeah, especially teachers and also language education study program can take these insights into practice. And Dr. Feniranda mentioned that amid the current situations with the online teaching and learning process, teachers and lecturers are required to adapt themselves in their classes, which require different kinds of strategies. Well, once again, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sayer and Dr. Feniranda. And on behalf of the Committee of the Seventh International Language and Language Teaching Conference, I would like to thank all the participants and the audience for tuning into the Zoom meeting. Now, at present, we have about 217 participants there at the Zoom meeting and more than 100 participants in the YouTube channels. So thank you very much indeed for tuning in into this conference. Well, I will give the time back to Ibu Mita. Thank you, Butri. Thank you, Dr. Peter Sayer, Ibu Johanna Veniranda, PhD, and Ibu Veronica Triprihatmini, MA. Let us give them a virtual applause. <laughs> virtual applause. All right, so um, we will have a photo session with the keynote speakers and also with the moderator. So everyone in the Zoom meeting, in the Zoom room, please turn on your camera. And please bear with me because we will take seven shots, okay? Because <laughs> there are so many of you in the Zoom meeting. All right, is the operator ready? Okay, one, two, three, smile. Done? One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, LLTC. <laughs> One, two, three, LLTC. One, two, three, LLTC. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. Is it done? One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you. So that's more than seven <laughs> times. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay, so thank you once again, Dr. Peter Sayer, uh, Ibu Veniranda, and Ibu Tri. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the first and the second parallel sessions. Uh, we will have two parallel sessions today, uh, and we will have lunch break in between. After the second parallel session, we will return to the Zoom main room to follow the third keynote speech at 2 p.m. So please make sure that you pay attention to your program book for further details on the schedule. Now to ensure the smoothness of the parallel sessions, allow me to read some essential information. So the first one and one thing and foremost is that you need to download the schedule that is available at the LLTC website and also in the program book. And you need to click the Zoom meeting, the link of the Zoom meeting for each parallel session which is already provided in the program book or in the schedule. And you might uh, please pay attention to the room and also to the time. 
Okay, now, uh, for general information, for presenters and participants, please use a laptop or desktop tablet smartphone with a microphone and a webcam. Please log in to your Zoom application or Zoom webpage and make sure that you have a stable internet connection. For plenary and parallel presentations, I'd like you to rename your account by using the format full name underscore affiliation. I repeat, full name underscore affiliation. To help keep background noise to a minimum, please, please make sure you mute your microphone when you are not speaking. If you are disconnected accidentally in the middle of the presentation, please rejoin by clicking the same Zoom link. If the power goes out, please wait for around five minutes for us to continue the session. Now, I'd like to explain a little bit on how to join the parallel sessions. In your program book, you will see what you are looking at right now in your screen, or on your screen. So on the left side, you have rooms, and on the right side, you have the title of the presentations. So you need to click the link, okay? But if you have problems with clicking the link, because sometimes you need to enter the passcode, then uh, the passcode will be provided for you in the Zoom chat room. Yeah, so the links and the Zoom uh, and the passcode and meeting ID will be provided in the Zoom chat room and also in the YouTube comment box. After this, I would like you to not leave this meeting room, but you need to go to the Zoom chat room to see the links and choose the preferred room. After you click the link of the room, the Zoom will direct you to join a new meeting. Please go to the next slide. Yes, so this is what you will see. So you don't, you don't need to leave the Zoom meeting. So all you need to do is go to the Zoom chat room or the, uh, and then click the preferred room. And you will see a notification on your screen, join new meeting, then please click leave and join. So you will be directly put in the preferred room. Each room has 40 participants. It so, uh, can receive up to 40 participants. So if it's already full, then you will receive a notification on your screen. If you have that notification, it means that you need to choose another room that is available. If you still have difficulties entering the chosen rooms, you may return to the Zoom main room by clicking the main room link, which is already provided also in the Zoom chat room. The help desk uh, people will assist you for the next steps. I believe that is all for now, and uh, I hope that all of you will have a fruitful discussion. We will see each other again in the Zoom main room at 2 p.m. for the third keynote speech. Thank you very much.
thank you, Bu. Tadi tuh saya tuh lihat di situ. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Tadi tuh saya lihat itu, Pak. Saya tuh lihat ke slide yang di belakang sana. Jadi matanya itu seperti ngambang ya. Tapi saya lihat sana.
Sangata Dharma lebih dari sekedar sebuah perguruan tinggi, tetapi merupakan sebuah ekosistem pendidikan yang disiapkan dan dilengkapi berbagai fasilitas dan tata kelola yang baik yang memungkinkan segenap generasi muda untuk menikmati kegembiraan, kepercayaan diri, serta pertumbuhan yang optimal. Selamat datang di Universitas Sanata Dharma, Yogyakarta. 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 karena rekomendasi dari dosen saya di UKSW menurut dosen saya, MPBI mempunyai mutu pendidikan yang baik selama saya berkuliah di sini saya bisa mendapatkan pengalaman belajar yang baik bersama dengan teman-teman yang berasal dari berbagai macam daerah selain itu, dosen di MPBI sangat suportif dalam bimbing saya dalam perkuliahan selain saya mendapatkan ilmu saya juga mempunyai banyak teman yang bisa memotivasi saya dalam belajar uh, perkenalkan nama saya Edit uh, jadi untuk alasan mengapa melanjutkan S2 uh, sebenarnya ini berdasarkan uh, pengalaman masa lalu jadi saya sudah mengajar di beberapa tempat mengajar bahasa Inggris lalu di situ yang merasa bahwa kemampuan uh, saya untuk mengajar uh, masih uh, kurang ya jadi saya memilih untuk waktu ini sebaiknya saya melanjutkan kuliah lagi uh, S2 ya agar uh, lebih 
merasa pede ketika saya mengajar atau mungkin di pekerjaan-pekerjaan saya selanjutnya. Kemudian untuk alasan mengambil MPPI sebenarnya dulu sempat mengambil uh, S2 juga di tempat lain, uh, tapi uh, ini waktu itu saya merasa kurang kurang tepat pilihannya karena jurusannya yang saya ambil pun saya merasa juga mata kuliahnya juga uh, sedikit kurang berkaitan dengan yang saya inginkan. Lalu uh, ada teman merekomendasikan saya untuk melanjutkan di MPPI dan ternyata mata kuliah yang di uh, yang ada di MPP itu sangat relevan untuk uh, ini keperluan saya menjadi pengajar di masa depan. Oke, jadi pengalaman belajar di MPP itu lebih ke ini sih. Uh, saya merasa uh, lingkungannya itu sangat positif. Jadi baik dari dosen maupun dari mahasiswa dari teman-temannya itu sangat uh, sangat sangat mendukung, sangat sangat support satu sama lain. Jadi Uh, ya kita sama-sama bekerja keras di sini dan kita juga sama-sama uh, membantu juga satu sama lain agar kita bisa uh, ini menyelesai, uh, menyelesaikan studi di ABBI dengan baik seperti itu. Nama saya Yuni Kompas, saya dari angkatan 2012 ABBI. Uh, Kenapa saya melanjutkan S2 saya? Karena saya merasa masih belum uh, cukup ilmu untuk menjadi guru yang lebih berkompeten lagi. Kemudian mengapa saya memilih uh, Sanata Dharma? Karena uh, Sanata Dharma uh, sudah banyak diakui oleh lulusannya kalau lulusannya itu uh, lebih unggul. Untuk pengalaman di selama saya bersekolah di sini, saya sendiri saya lebih banyak mendapatkan pengalaman karena uh, di, uh, di pendidikan saya yang sebelumnya sangat berbeda dengan apa yang saya dapatkan di Sanata Dharma, di mana di sini lebih ditekankan tentang uh, untuk lebih disiplin, kemudian uh, kita di sini dituntut untuk bagaimana lebih uh, kritikal di dalam uh, mengerjakan segala sesuatu. Kemudian di sini saya juga mendapat uh, keluarga baru dan teman-teman sekitar dan dosen-dosen uh, sekalian uh, selalu mensupport dan memotivasi saya dalam uh, belajar saya. Halo. Saya Luciana, saya dari Page 2018. Saya adalah seorang independent teacher dan entrepreneur. Um, alasan saya untuk melanjutkan kuliah di MPBI adalah karena saya perlu berada di suatu komunitas akademis dan saya juga ingin sekali untuk mengembangkan bisnis saya di bagian education. Um, kenapa saya memilih Sanata Dharma, MPBI Sanata Dharma? Karena saya sangat nyaman dengan situasi di Sanata Dharma. Saya sudah mengenal beberapa dosen-dosen Sanata Dharma sebelumnya karena memang saya dulu juga lulusan Sanata Dharma. Lalu kami semua juga punya kesempatan untuk mengambil PLT Practicum di luar negeri dan itu sangat berbeda dengan uh, universitas-universitas lain. Um, bagi saya selama dua semester ini saya sudah mendapatkan banyak sekali pengalaman untuk diri saya, untuk mengembangkan diri saya sebagai seorang pendidik. Terus, um, saya sangat merekomendasikan teman-teman untuk mengambil MPBI Sanata Dharma karena ya memang, I think this place is the best for you. Thank you. Oke, okay, uh, jadi nama saya Desa Ayo Adiknya. Saat ini saya sedang di semester 2 MPBI, kemudian saya berpengalaman mengajar berdua tahun saya mengajar Mandarin dan English juga uh, tapi uh, di waktu lalu saya memilih untuk belajar di MPPI karena saya yakin uh, ini akan memberikan peningkatan terhadap uh, profesi saya sebagai guru kemudian untuk jenjang karir yang lebih lanjut saya juga mengambil ilmu yang saya belajar lagi saya suka belajar sehingga uh, MPBI saya pikir adalah tempat yang tepat buat saya karena saya juga mengikuti pendidikan Yesuit dari sejak sana dari Profesor Yudho mungkin di saat ada teman tentunya pendidikan yang hasil sangat menginspirasi saya sehingga saya memilih MPBI saat ada teman untuk belajar untuk memperkenalkan kegurauan saya kemudian saya sampai memutuskan keluar dari kerja dahulu supaya saya bisa fokus untuk belajar dan ternyata memang menyenangkan karena ada banyak hal-hal yang saya belum alami, kemudian saya mempelajari hal yang saya sudah alami 
Kemudian dari tempat itu, saya berjaya menyesal sendiri dan pengalaman uh, saya berkonfirmasi uh, oleh uh, ibu yang saya baca dan menarik sekali di BBI saya berkata karena uh, belajar di sini tidak terasa betul-betul seperti apa uh, belajar formal seperti itu ya. Tapi ada nilai nilai keluarga di sini dari para dosen maupun teman-teman mahasiswa semuanya sangat supportif dan melalui diskusi-diskusi grup uh, yang kerja di Cepokok dan melalui tugas-tugas yang ada uh, kami banyak belajar dan tumbuh bersama jadi uh, tidak hanya uh, melalui mengenai uh, teori saja tapi di sini kita juga diajarkan untuk berpikir kritis kritikal thinking untuk menanggapi berbagai fenomena dunia yang tidak bisa kita uh, just sit down dan putihnya tapi kita dilatih untuk menjadi guru-guru yang juga komitif yang melayani jadi ada Di situ yang saya saya suka sekali berjadi terima kasih. Oke, okay, nama saya Fika dari MBBI angkatan 2017. Saya adalah alumni dari BBI angkatan 2017. Saya lulus tahun 2017 dan pada saat itu saya lang- langsung lanjut ke MBBI 2017. Dan kenapa saya langsung lanjut ke MBBI? Karena yang pertama pada saat itu saya masih mempunyai semangat dan motivasi untuk kuliah. Dan yang kedua adalah saat itu ditawarkan beasiswa untuk anak-anak yang ingin mengambil scholarship Jadi saya pada saat itu mengambil beasiswa dan akhirnya saya mendapatkan beasiswa tersebut Dan yang ketiga adalah dosen-dosen di S2 adalah dosen-dosen yang mengajar di S1 juga Jadi saya sudah mengenal bagaimana karakteristik para dosen Dan yang keempat tentunya saya ingin mendapat teman-teman baru dan pengalaman baru Halo semuanya, nama saya Martina Andriani Saya adalah mahasiswa S2 Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris Universitas Sanata Dharma Angkatan 2017 Di sini saya akan sedikit berbagi mengenai jurusan S2 Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris Awalnya mengapa saya memilih untuk melanjutkan kuliah S2 PBI itu karena saya mendapatkan kesan positif selama membantu mengajar di kegiatan gereja dekat rumah Bahwa pekerjaan mengajar adalah pekerjaan yang menyenangkan, saya bisa bertemu dengan banyak anak-anak Selain itu pula saya juga menyenangi pelajaran bahasa Inggris masa saya sekolah Dan mengapa saya memilih untuk melanjutkan di Universitas Sanata Dharma itu karena saya mendapatkan rekomendasi dari guru-guru di kegiatan sosial tersebut bahwa Universitas Sanata Dharma memiliki reputasi yang positif sejak dahulu apalagi untuk jurusan pendidikan bahasa Inggris sama saya berkuliah di Universitas Sanata Dharma saya mendapatkan berbagai manfaat yaitu saya bisa mendapatkan ilmu-ilmu pendidikan dari dosen-dosen yang berkapabilitas Selain itu pula, saya juga dilatih untuk banyak berbicara bahasa Inggris dengan dosen dan juga dengan teman-teman di kelas. Untuk pengalaman yang tidak bisa saya lupakan selama saya belajar di Universitas Sanata Dharma adalah ketika saya melakukan praktikum ILT, yaitu praktek mengajar anak-anak S1. Waktu itu saya merasa gugup dan saya merasa teknik saya kurang baik, akan tetapi dengan bantuan para dosen-dosen yang ada saya bisa merasakan kesan yang positif dan saya bisa tenang juga selama melakukan praktek mengajar tersebut saya berterima kasih bahwa saya bisa berkuliah di Universitas Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta Nama saya Miss Rima saya adalah seorang perempuan yang suka bekerja dan juga berkarir saya melanjutkan kuliah S2 karena saya ingin memperdalam ilmu dan mengembangkan karir di dunia pendidikan. Kemudian, kenapa saya memilih MBBI di Sanata Dharma? Ada berbagai alasan. Yang pertama adalah saya suka dengan kampus ini. Di Sanata Dharma ini memberikan kenyamanan untuk belajar bagi setiap mahasiswanya. Kemudian, program studi yang saya ambil MBBI itu linier dengan program studi yang saya ambil di S1 yaitu di bidang pendidikan kemudian nomor tiga saya telah mengenal dosen-dosennya dan semua dosen yang mengajar di MPBI ini hebat dan luar biasa dan juga modern nah kemudian tentang pengalaman kuliah selama ini saya merasa sangat beruntung bisa kembali 
mendapatkan tantangan belajar dan mengerjakan penelitian. Tidak dipungkiri bahwa semua tugas-tugas yang diberikan itu membutuhkan tenaga ekstra, kemudian waktu yang banyak untuk dikerjakan, untuk mengerjakan. Tapi ini semua adalah bagian dari masa depan yang lebih cerah. Terima kasih. Halo, selamat pagi. Nama saya Indah, mahasiswa FPDI 2018. Nah, di sini saya akan memberikan testimoni dengan saya mengapa saya melanjutkan S2 di FPDI. Alasan saya yaitu saya seorang guru dan saya punya tuntutan profesi untuk mengembangkan karir saya untuk menjadi guru yang lebih profesional dan lebih berkompeten lagi. Lalu alasan saya memilih MPBI karena karena jurusan ini linear dengan uh, jurusan saya ketika saya satu guru. Nah, kemudian saya juga yakin uh, dan percaya bahwa para dosen itu sangat uh, berkompeten dan punya kualitas yang baik dalam memfasilitasi saya dan para mahasiswa lainnya untuk mengembangkan ilmu kami. Selain itu, di sini saya juga belajar tentang bagaimana menghargai keberagaman karena teman-teman saya berasal dari banyak suku yang berbeda, budaya dan agama. Jadi di sini saya tidak hanya belajar tentang ilmu mengajar dan ilmu bahasa Inggris, tapi juga belajar bagaimana menghargai Kemudian yang terakhir pengalaman saya e, belajar di FPB sama Tandema yaitu e, di sini kami dituntut untuk melakukan banyak penelitian. Jadi dari penelitian itu e, kami bisa mengembangkan wawasan kami. Selain itu kami bisa mengembangkan cara berpikir e, kritis kami dengan membaca banyak jurnal dan banyak literatur lainnya. Terima kasih.
memilih MPBI karena rekomendasi dari dosen saya di UKSW menurut dosen saya MPBI punya mutu pendidikan yang baik selama saya berkuliah di sini saya bisa mendapatkan pengalaman belajar yang baik bersama dengan teman-teman yang berasal dari berbagai macam daerah selain itu dosen di MPBI sangat suportif dalam membimbing saya dalam perkuliahan selain saya mendapatkan ilmu saya juga mempunyai banyak teman yang bisa memotivasi saya dalam belajar uh, perkenalkan nama saya Edit uh, jadi untuk alasan mengapa melanjutkan S2 uh, sebenarnya ini berdasarkan uh, pengalaman masa lalu jadi saya sudah mengajar di beberapa tempat mengajar bahasa Inggris lalu di situ saya merasa bahwa uh, kemampuan saya untuk mengajar uh, masih uh, kurang ya jadi saya memilih untuk waktu ini sebaiknya saya melanjutkan kuliah lagi uh, S2 ya agar uh, lebih merasa pede ketika saya mengajar atau mungkin di pekerjaan-pekerjaan saya selanjutnya kemudian untuk alasan mengambil MPPI sebenarnya dulu sempat mengambil uh, S2 juga di tempat lain uh, tapi uh, ini waktu itu saya merasa kurang kurang tepat pilihannya karena jurusannya yang saya ambil pun saya merasa juga mata kuliahnya juga uh, sedikit kurang berkaitan dengan yang saya inginkan lalu uh, ada teman merekomendasikan saya untuk melanjutkan di MPBI dan ternyata mata kuliah yang di uh, yang ada di MPBI itu sangat relevan untuk uh, ini keperluan saya menjadi pengajar di masa depan jadi, jadi pengalaman belajar di MPBI itu lebih ke ini sih uh, saya merasa uh, lingkungannya itu sangat positif jadi baik dari dosen maupun dari mahasiswa dari teman-temannya itu sangat uh, sangat sangat mendukung sangat mensupport satu sama lain jadi uh, ya kita mem- sama-sama bekerja keras di sini dan kita juga sama-sama uh, membantu juga satu sama lain agar kita bisa uh, ini menyelesaikan studi di ABBI dengan baik seperti itu. Nama saya Yuni Kompa, saya dari Angkatan Bulu-Bulu uh, MPBI. Mengapa uh, saya melanjutkan S2 saya? Karena saya merasa masih belum uh, cukup ilmu untuk menjadi guru yang lebih berkompeten lagi. Kemudian mengapa saya memilih uh, Sanata Dharma? Karena <tuh> Sanata Dharma uh, sudah banyak diakui oleh lulusannya kalau lulusannya itu uh, lebih unggul. Untuk pengalaman di selama saya bersekolah di sini, saya sendiri saya lebih banyak mendapatkan pengalaman karena uh, di, uh, di pendidikan saya yang sebelumnya sangat berbeda dengan apa yang saya dapatkan di Sanata Dharma, di mana di sini lebih ditekankan tentang uh, untuk lebih disiplin, kemudian uh, kita di sini dituntut untuk bagaimana lebih uh, kritikal di dalam uh, mengerjakan segala sesuatu. Kemudian di sini saya juga mendapat uh, keluarga baru dan teman-teman sekitar dan dosen-dosen uh, sekalian uh, selalu mensupport dan memotivasi saya dalam uh, belajar saya. Halo, saya Luciana, saya dari Batch 2018. Saya adalah seorang independent teacher dan entrepreneur. Um, alasan saya untuk melanjutkan kuliah di MPBI adalah karena saya perlu berada di suatu komunitas akademis dan saya juga ingin sekali untuk mengembangkan bisnis saya di bagian education. Um, kenapa saya memilih Sanata Dharma, MPBI Sanata Dharma? Karena saya sangat nyaman dengan situasi di Sanata Dharma. Saya sudah mengenal beberapa dosen-dosen Sanata Dharma sebelumnya karena memang saya dulu juga lulusan Sanata Dharma. Lalu kami semua juga punya kesempatan untuk mengambil PLT Practicum di luar negeri dan itu sangat berbeda dengan uh, universitas-universitas lain. Um, bagi saya, selama dua semester ini, saya sudah mendapatkan banyak sekali pengalaman untuk diri saya, untuk mengembangkan diri saya sebagai seorang pendidik. Terus, um, saya sangat merekomendasikan teman-teman untuk mengambil MPB Sanata Dharma karena ya memang I think this place is the best for you. Thank you. Oke, okay, uh, jadi nama saya Desa Yoranik ya. Saat ini saya sedang di semester 2 PBI, kemudian saya berpengalaman mengajar beberapa tahun, saya mengajar Korean dan English juga. 
tapi uh, di waktu lalu saya memilih untuk belajar di MPPI karena saya yakin uh, ini akan memberikan peningkatan terhadap uh, profesi saya sebagai guru. Kemudian untuk jenjang karir yang lebih lanjut, saya sudah mengambil dunia dari belajar lagi. Saya suka belajar sehingga uh, MPPI saya pikir adalah tempat yang tepat buat saya karena saya juga mengikuti pendidikan yang sulit dari sejak sana dari profesor itu mungkin di saat terdama tentunya pendidikan yang hasil yang sangat menginspirasi saya sehingga saya memilih MPPI saat terdama untuk belajar untuk memperkenal dan berguruan saya kemudian saya sampai memutuskan keluar dari kerja dahulu supaya saya bisa fokus untuk belajar dan ternyata memang menyenangkan karena ada banyak hal-hal yang saya belum alami, kemudian saya mempelajari itu dan hal yang saya sudah alami kemudian saya belajar tentang itu dan saya belajar banyak selain di sini dan pengalaman saya berkonfirmasi oleh itu yang saya belajar dan menarik sekali di FDI saya berkata karena belajar di sini tidak terasa betul-betul seperti belajar formal seperti itu tapi ada belajar keluarga yang ada di sini dari para dosen maupun teman-teman mahasiswa semuanya sangat sportif dan melalui diskusi-diskusi guru, melalui kerja-kerja kompok, dan melalui tugas-tugas yang ada kami banyak belajar dan tumbuh bersama jadi tidak hanya perlu mengenai teori saja tapi di sini kita juga diajarkan untuk berpikir kritis, critical thinking untuk menghadapi berbagai fenomena dunia yang bisa kita share sitam dan putihnya tapi kita dilatih untuk menjadi guru-guru yang juga komitif yang melayani jadi ada di situ yang saya saya suka sekali terjadi di sini. Terima kasih. Okay, nama saya Fika dari MBBI angkatan 2017. Saya adalah alumni dari BBI angkatan 2017. Saya lulus tahun 2017 dan pada saat itu saya lanjut masuk lanjut ke MBBI 2017. Dan mengapa saya langsung lanjut ke MBBI? Karena yang pertama pada saat itu saya masih mempunyai semangat dan motivasi untuk kuliah. Dan yang kedua adalah saat itu ditawarkan beasiswa untuk anak-anak yang ingin mengambil scholarship Jadi saya pada saat itu mengambil beasiswa dan akhirnya saya mendapatkan beasiswa tersebut Dan yang ketiga adalah dosen-dosen di S2 adalah dosen-dosen yang mengajar di S1 juga Jadi saya sudah mengenal bagaimana karakteristik para dosen Dan yang keempat tentunya saya ingin mendapat teman-teman baru dan pengalaman baru. Halo semuanya, nama saya Martina Andriani. Saya adalah mahasiswa S2 Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris Universitas Sanata Dharma Angkatan 2017. Di sini saya akan sedikit berbagi mengenai jurusan S2 Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris. Awalnya, mengapa saya memilih untuk melanjutkan kuliah S2 PBI itu karena saya mendapatkan kesan positif selama membantu mengajar di kegiatan gereja dekat rumah. Bahwa pekerjaan mengajar adalah pekerjaan yang menyenangkan, saya bisa bertemu dengan banyak anak-anak. Selain itu pula, saya juga menyenangi pelajaran bahasa Inggris semasa saya sekolah. Dan mengapa saya memilih untuk melanjutkan di Universitas Sanata Dharma? Itu karena saya mendapatkan rekomendasi dari guru-guru di kegiatan sosial tersebut Bahwa Universitas Sanata Dharma memiliki reputasi yang positif sejak dahulu Apalagi untuk jurusan pendidikan bahasa Inggris Sama saya berkuliah di Universitas Sanata Dharma Saya mendapatkan berbagai manfaat Yaitu saya bisa mendapatkan ilmu-ilmu pendidikan dari dosen-dosen yang berkapabilitas Selain itu pula, saya juga dilatih untuk banyak berbicara bahasa Inggris dengan dosen dan juga dengan teman-teman di kelas. Untuk pengalaman yang tidak bisa saya lupakan selama saya belajar di Universitas Sanata Dharma adalah ketika saya melakukan praktikum ILT, yaitu praktek mengajar anak-anak S1. Waktu itu saya merasa gugup dan saya merasa teknik saya kurang baik, akan tetapi dengan bantuan para dosen-dosen yang ada, saya bisa merasakan kesan yang positif dan saya bisa 
tenang juga selama melakukan praktek mengajar tersebut. Saya berterima kasih bahwa saya bisa berkuliah di Universitas Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta. Saya Misterima, saya adalah seorang perempuan yang suka bekerja dan juga berkarir. Saya melanjutkan kuliah S2 karena saya ingin memperdalam ilmu dan mengembangkan karir di dunia pendidikan. Kemudian, kenapa saya memilih MPBI di Sanata Dharma? Ada berbagai alasan. Yang pertama adalah saya suka dengan kampus ini. Di Sanata Dharma ini memberikan kenyamanan untuk belajar bagi setiap mahasiswanya. Kemudian, program studi yang saya ambil, MPBI itu linier dengan program studi yang saya ambil di S1, yaitu di bidang pendidikan. Kemudian, nomor tiga, saya telah mengenal dosen-dosennya dan semua dosen yang mengajar di MPBI ini hebat dan luar biasa, dan juga modern. Nah, kemudian, tentang pengalaman kuliah selama ini, saya merasa sangat beruntung bisa kembali mendapatkan tantangan belajar, dan mengerjakan penelitian tidak dipungkiri bahwa semua tugas-tugas yang diberikan itu membutuhkan tenaga ekstra kemudian waktu yang banyak untuk dikerjakan untuk mengerjakan tapi ini semua adalah bagian dari masa depan yang lebih cerah terima kasih halo selamat pagi nama saya Indra mahasiswa FPTI tahun dan di sini saya akan memberikan testimoni saya mengapa saya melanjutkan S2 di MPBI. Alasan saya yaitu uh, saya seorang guru dan saya punya tuntutan profesi untuk mengembangkan karir saya untuk menjadi guru yang lebih profesional dan lebih berkompeten lagi. Lalu alasan saya memilih MPBI karena karena jurusan ini linear dengan uh, jurusan saya ketika saya S1 dulu. Nah, kemudian saya juga yakin dan percaya bahwa para dosen itu sangat berkompeten dan mempunyai kualitas yang baik dalam memfasilitasi saya dan para mahasiswa lainnya untuk mengembangkan ilmu kami. Selain itu, di sini saya juga belajar tentang bagaimana menghargai keberagaman karena teman-teman saya berasal dari banyak suku yang berbeda, budaya dan agama. Di sini saya tidak hanya belajar tentang ilmu mengajar dan ilmu bahasa Inggris, tapi juga belajar bagaimana menghargai keberagaman. Kemudian yang terakhir pengalaman saya belajar di APB Sana Tanjima, yaitu di sini kami dituntut untuk melakukan banyak penelitian. Jadi dari penelitian itu kami bisa mengembangkan wawasan kami. Selain itu kami bisa mengembangkan cara berpikir. Kritis kami dengan membaca banyak jurnal dan banyak literatur lainnya. Terima kasih. Sanata Dharma lebih dari sekedar sebuah perguruan tinggi, tetapi merupakan sebuah ekosistem pendidikan yang disiapkan dan dilengkapi berbagai fasilitas dan tata kelola yang baik, yang memungkinkan segenap generasi muda untuk menikmati kegembiraan, kepercayaan diri, serta pertumbuhan yang optimal. Selamat datang di Universitas Sanata Dharma, Yogyakarta. Yogyakarta. Yogyakarta.
Good afternoon, Dr. Hahn. Good afternoon. And Hi, good morning for me. I'm very well. Good morning for me. It's how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for checking out the this chair screen. And I can see that you have no problem with your um, voice and your vo uh, microphone. Good. There is an echo from your side. Do you hear an echo from me as well? I think it's in my part. I don't know okay, why. that's okay. That's okay. As long as you can hear me clearly. Okay, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a few minutes now. So you can see my purple slide then. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. OK, yeah, yeah. so apparently it was my mistake. I turned on two microphones at once. Sorry for that. Well, it happens. <laughs> OK, Be so. Better two than one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, you know, the your voice is uh, loud and clear, and your PowerPoint is excellent. So you, know, you can Good. stop sharing the screen at the moment. OK, I'll stop sharing for now. That's All right. OK. OK, thank you, Dr. Han. Thank you. Looking forward. Check, check. One, two, three. What about my, is it still, is it okay now? Okay. Still Chris a Chris <laughs> Should I change microphones? Check, check. Is this better? Ladies and gentlemen, the same thing? Still Chris a Chris. <laughs> Still breaking up. I turn on my microphone that terus gemai dulu. Do you want me to talk again? Or sing? Butruli, you can sing. <laughs> sing and everyone will run away. Coba microphone. Oh, wala. Belum. <laughs> tes, tes. Bisa dengar ya? Get. Kresek-kresek. Apa terlalu dekat aku? Kurang mundur. Lagi, tes, tes, halo, tes, satu, dua, tiga, tes, tes, tes. 
masih kresek mati tes tes oke okay. alright ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the key third keynote session I would like to remind you all that you, we will provide the exit ticket for day one right after the third keynote speech. The link will be available at around 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. This exit ticket will become your attendance list for the first day of the conference. Please note that you will be eligible to receive the e-certificate only if you have submitted the exit ticket for day one and day two and have registered your email in the website. Should you have any questions, you may contact our help desk through the provided uh, Zoom chat room. The parallel sessions will be available at PBI USD YouTube channel maybe later tonight, and the sessions will be found in the playlist. In this session, we will listen to a talk which will be delivered by Dr. Naima Bihan from Leeds Beckett University, United Kingdom. The one-hour talk will be moderated by Dr. Made Frida Yulia from Sanata Dharma University. For participants, you can post your questions in the Zoom chat room if you are joining from Zoom or in the YouTube comment box if you are joining us from YouTube. Ibu Dr. Made Frida Yulia, the time is yours. Thank you, Bumita, for time. Good afternoon, all conference participants, wherever you are. Welcome back to the plenary session of the Seven Language and Language Teaching Conference. My name is Frida, and I will serve as the moderator for this session. This afternoon, we're going to listen to the third keynote speech, which is also the last program of today's conference. But before we embark upon that, uh, I'd like to remind you again as what uh, the Master of Ceremony has mentioned. Should you have any question, you can post it either in the Zoom chat room if you are joining us from uh, Zoom or in the YouTube comment box if you are joining us from our YouTube channel. Well, you may do it uh, 15 minutes before the talk is over. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please allow me now to introduce our keynote speaker for the third plenary session. She is Dr. Naima Han, a course leader for the MA in English Language Teaching at Leeds Beckett University, United Kingdom, and she began her career teaching English to Afghan refugees. She then taught and coordinated English for speakers of other languages, an institute of linguist diploma in public service interpreting in Bradford, United Kingdom, and trained teachers of English. She has written literacy materials for adult learners for the British Educational Communication and Technology Agency and accreditation for first language literacy. Uh, she is interested in researching language learning materials learner strategy, and motivation for language learning, especially in low literate contexts. Well, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Naima Han. Naima, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frida. And may I say how lovely it is to see you again oh, yeah. uh, after yeah. our time together in Leeds. Yeah. And, and, um, I hope you're continuing your wonderful work with academic reading for teachers. Um, that, that is a very useful area to look at. Um, so um, may I thank our hosts, um, 
very warmly for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak with uh, colleagues in Indonesia again. Yes, please I do. Always find, yeah, please do. I always find Indonesian um, colleagues uh, to be full of ideas and enthusiasm, but also a lot of hard work. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk to you about the challenges and opportunities uh, that this new uh, this new environment presents um, for all of us. Uh, we didn't choose uh, to be in this online environment, but along with challenges, it brings many opportunities as well. For example, I'm sure that today, many of you who are here um, listening to me um, would may may not have been able to attend the conference physically, so so there are many opportunities as well. So I'm just going to um, share my slides. So, in terms of um, online sessions, um, it's always good to have some visual reminders as well. Um, so let's see. Hopefully, very soon you will be able to see a purple slide. Um, maybe I could have a thumbs up from Frida that I can see if you can see a purple slide um, on the screen. Okay, so thank you again to the Language and Le uh, Language Teaching Conference organizers, to Sanata Dharma University in Yogyakarta, and to uh, the moderators, conference team, and especially you, the audience. So let's just remind ourselves of where we are at the moment. So we are in a lockdown, um, different stages of lockdown, different degrees of lockdown due to, due to the pandemic, and we rely on the internet. It is what connects us with each other and the outside world. Uh, so, but before the lockdown, the internet was considered a distraction. Um, we, we felt that it led to shallow thinking because we would serve the internet without actually uh, pondering uh, an issue in depth. However, now it's a lifeline. If I shop, if I'm in touch with you, if I'm in touch with colleagues, when I teach students in Leeds, it's all through the internet. If my internet connection goes down, I'll be cut off from the world. It is also a source of information, and like today's session, it's a source of interaction. We are able to uh, connect with each other because of the internet. So, while there are challenges, uh, the internet is a great opportunity as well. So how can we make the most of this opportunity? So today, I'm going to focus on making the most of internet opportunities through the lens of adapting materials for online teaching. And in order to do this, I'm going to, first of all, talk with you about the functions of learning materials, just to remind ourselves of the role of materials in learning, challenges in online courses, and then some principles and procedures for adapting existing materials for online and offline sessions. Um, because we really don't have the time to do everything from scratch. So it would be good if we were able to adapt existing materials for our online teaching, uh, which could be synchronous like this, where we, you and I are all together in the same time uh, on the same platform, or it could be asynchronous, where we make materials available outside uh, this direct contact and some activities for the students to interact with the materials. And finally, I'm going to share an example for speaking and reading activities. The example comes from materials uh, which are freely available on the British Council website. And there is a link in my PowerPoint for accessing those. So to begin with, let's think of the environment we are in. So with my students, if they can use the chat box, I usually ask them to type three words about something. I give them very clear and focused instructions. So for example, uh, if you're able to use the chat box, if not, just write down three words for what you can see outside your window. So from your windows, you're going to see some wonderful green things because Indonesia is so beautiful and green. Uh, so three words or three phrases. So for example, green, cool grass, a tall mango tree, and then write down three things 
that you want to know from today's session. So three things that you want to know from today's session. So now I'm going to be silent for a minute to let you do these two tasks. Okay, so I'm going to be silent for a minute. You won't hear me. Okay, so in my lesson, I would actually give two to three minutes for this task. And silence in a session is very important. As teachers, we are often afraid of silence. We feel that we need to fill in the spaces, but our students need the silence to take in the instructions that we are giving them and to uh, actually carry out the task. So no matter how tempted you are, maintain the silence for two or three minutes. It gives your students some space to think and reflect and to actually absorb um, what you're trying to do in the lesson. Something else that I tend not to do is to look at the chat box if I'm sharing my screen. Because not everyone may want their comments to be seen by everyone, because when I share my screen, everybody can see the chat box. So here is another tip. So if you can open a window and if there is, or if you have two screens and you can open the chat box on a second screen, that would be ideal. Okay, so now let's return to materials. These were just some strategies for your online session. So what are materials? So they could be written texts. These could be videos or audios, or it could be us performing. So in, in a classroom, we often mime out a word, don't we? especially if these are verbs or adverbs. Sometimes we ask our students to act out by mime, I mean to act out a phrase or a bit of vocabulary. Uh, materials are also pictures with no text. So we may show a picture and ask for our students to respond to the picture. We may ask them to draw some pictures or they could be objects, real life objects. And so I, I draw heavily on uh, Tomlinson, Brian Tomlinson, the guru of materials development, and Ivor Timmis, a uh, professor in English language teaching who has recently retired from our university. They have done marvelous work around uh, English language teaching and materials development. And you know, do look at their work if you're not familiar with it. So materials can also be activities. So these could be activities to introduce or notice language, to practice language, and to produce language. So if you just look at this list that you see on your screen, there isn't a lot of production involved. So again, I'll remind you of the importance of silence. It's very important in online sessions and in on-site sessions to give your students time to absorb and respond to whatever you're showing them or sharing with them. And imagination, that's the biggest resource, the biggest material. Get, you know, get the students to stop and think, not produce immediately, not practice immediately, but just use their imagination to, to put images together or to put language together. Okay, so those were examples of what could be materials. So what is the purpose of second or foreign language learning materials and how do we use these materials? So materials are a source of target language, okay? Because often uh, when we teach a foreign language, we are in a country or in a geographical space or even an online space where our learners may not have that language around them in a natural environment. So the materials are the only source of the target language. 
They are the examples of language standards. Okay, so course books, global course books, are often a particular language variety. They could be, in term, you know, when we think of English, it could be the American variety of English, or the British variety of English. Um, so um, they could. Uh, materials also develop language in a staged manner. Okay, uh, bit by bit. It may not be very linear but it's, it could be like a jigsaw coming together, but it happens bit by bit, not all at once. They allow students to recap and practice if we are using a course book or if we make all our materials available on the VLE online, students can go back and look at those. And I'm going to come back to this principle later in my talk. Uh, materials also help teachers. When I started teaching English when I was 15, many, many decades ago, um, almost 40, 50 years ago, so you can tell how old I am, um, it's, I understood about language systems. I was a fluent English language user, but I didn't always understand how grammar worked. And it was teaching that helped me understand grammar. Okay, so, so we have just looked at what materials are and how and why we use English language or any language teaching materials. Okay, so what are our challenges? So if you can use the chat box, write three words in the chat box to describe your challenges and preface this with your role. So, you know, whether you are a student, so you could be a student teacher, you could be a teacher, or you could be an administrator. So here are some examples of challenges. As a student, you may not have enough broadband to perhaps watch some of the videos that your teachers have put on. As a teacher, you may still be getting used to the platform, which could be Zoom. We at our university use Teams. And I'll be honest with you, I'm still trying to understand how to use Teams. Um, so I'm going to be silent again for a minute uh, while you write these um, three words. So choose one role, student, teacher, or administrator, or a new role, and three words to describe your challenges in this word, in this role. So I will be silent for a minute. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to reflect on your challenges. So what are the challenges? Um, motivation, keeping our students motivated. And so here there is a bit of a tension. So usually in an on-site classroom, when we are physically in the classroom with our students, um, you know, there's a bit of competition. Students do compete with each other in terms of completing a task first or completing it more accurately. And yet we also want them to work together in pairs and groups uh, and you know, pool their energy, their knowledge to, to develop their language. So you know, it's, it's a question of somehow bringing both into play competition and community in, in a virtual classroom, in a virtual session. Um, and then also student retention. So, you know, making sure that students stay to the end of the session. And also they complete the course. Uh, if there's an assessment at the end of the course, you know, to, to complete the course. So how can we do this? I'm going to share some tips with you towards the end of my session, but I just want you to think about these challenges. Also, we want to make sure that all of our students 
get a similar experience and learn um, you know, similar amounts of language in a useful manner. So, you know, how do we differentiate to, to make that learning experience equally useful for all our students? So Jeff Petty actually gives a very useful framework for differentiation. I won't go into that now, but I have shared that in the past with other sessions I've done with colleagues in, in Indonesia, and there'll be a link in uh, the My PowerPoint. Um, and then, of course, we need to remember that in many cases, our students are digital natives. That is, they were living in an online environment even before the lockdown, before we were all forced online. And people like me are digital immigrants. So, you know, I'm not constantly looking at my uh, WhatsApp or, you know, I'm not constantly on Instagram. Um, a lot of my time is spent, you know, reading actual physical books paper copies of things so you know some of us are digital natives some of us are digital immigrants and how to make the most of that um, this is approached in a different way by white and lacorny who we'll talk about residents and visitors so people like me tend to be visitors who use online facilities for particular tasks or purposes um, and others might be you know online for all their uh, sort of activities in their daily lives and then, of course, assessment. Online assessment is a big challenge. We won't be able to go into that in great detail today. But, uh, you know, there are issues such as cheating and plagiarism, uh, which do happen in physical um, learning environments as well. But they can be magnified many fold in online learning environments. Um, so to, to prevent that, really, we need to motivate the students um, to, to engage with the sessions and, and how can we do that? This will unfold as, as my talk goes on. So let's begin with looking at materials adaptation, more about adaptation, less about writing. So what do material writers need to know? Here I draw on Tomlinson and Timis. So, you know, as, as Professor Timis says, they don't always know this. So we need to know who the learners are so, you know, I often suggest to colleagues that you get together in groups and divide up the course material so that, you know, two or three or four of you are writing the materials for each bit of the course and then sharing it with the rest of the teachers. You can do this at institutional level. You can do this at regional level so that, you know, you're, one person is not having to keep doing all the materials for a course. Share. So you need to know who your learners are across the region. Uh, second language acquisition principles, so how people learn a language, what are the opportunities, what are the barriers, and also language teaching methodology. So think very carefully, what will the teachers be doing? What will the students be doing in this lesson? So, you know, to achieve that language learning aim. And then, you know, think of the teachers. What is the level of English of the teachers? What training have they had to teach languages? Um, what is the educational culture? Uh, is it okay for students to speak up during the session? Um, you know, do you expect your students to take some uh, initiative, some autonomy? Uh, are you comfortable with students taking the lead? And then what type of course it is? How long is each lesson? How often does the lesson take place? If it's only once a week, you will need to build in more time for revision and recapping and recycling. And then what kind of assessments are the students going to do? Is it going to be in-house? Um, or is it a national or international assessment like um, an IELTS exam? And then what resources are available to you as teachers, and I include time in the resource, but also what resources are available to your students? What is their broadband width, for example? What device will they, will they access the materials on? <clears throat> so what about second language acquisition? So we find that research shows that uh, learners need to be exposed to the target language and they need to practice and they need to be motivated and often the motivation comes from successful interaction. So, you know, short tasks 
which uh, makes them feel that they are successful in using English or Japanese or whichever language you are teaching. So some materials development principles. The syllabus, so there are different principles. I like the text-driven approach. I feel comfortable with that. And if we just think back to an earlier slide, what could be text? They could be audios or videos, or they could be written materials like short stories or a newspaper article or a blog from the internet. Uh, and then text should be used as a basis for language work on selected lexical, grammatical, or discourse features. So make sure that the language focus is clear and shared with the students. Um, and the tasks need to help comprehension, and they should come before text analysis. So make sure that students understand what they have read before you st start taking it apart for language features. And then language-focused work should reflect what we know about the nature of language. And this is where I would encourage you to bring in first language. Make comparisons and parallels with the student's first language or a shared language. Okay? And then rather than getting them to produce, get them to focus um, on discovery and noticing. And what do I mean by this? This will come through in the example that I'm going to share in a couple of slides. So um, when writing materials, uh, Tom Denison suggests a framework. So to write a unit of materials or a lesson, choose your text carefully, have some readiness activities. So before the students read the text, you know, what we call not quite the same, but similar to activating schemata, get them to experience the text and then get them to respond to the text and then some activities to develop their language, to res respond to the input. And so this draws on the lexical approach. And the example I'm going to share was uh, comes from a set of materials by Carlos Islam and Ivor Timis, and it's on the British Council Teaching English website. So just to remind ourselves, when selecting the text, you know, make sure that the text motivates the learners. So get the students to choose the text. Uh, you know, before the course begins even, ask them about which topics they're interested in. Texts need to be at an appropriate level, so not too easy. Just one little bit above what they're comfortable with so that there is some new material in there. They need to contain the target language you want them to focus on, if it is adverbs. And of course, all this needs to be in the same text. So this, need, this is quite a task, which is why I keep suggesting that people will work in groups. So how have we put our on-site materials online? So an on-site activity could be something like this. Students are asked to read a story about two boys, uh, well, several boys who go for a day out and so there is a before you read activity. I hope you can see that on the screen. Students are asked to read a story about a boy who has upset his parents. And there is an extract from the story. Uh, the extract is, I got slapped three times with the sole of her shoe, three times. That was it. Then she left my room. She never said a word. So ask the students what, you know, who could be her? I is clearly the boy the story is about. Who could be her? Uh, and then do these sentences come at the beginning, in the middle, or the end of the story? And then ask them to read the first sentence and predict what the story is about. And then not rush into reading the story, but to write down these guesses. They could do this in the chat box and discuss with other students. So online, how do we do this? I would start with a PowerPoint, uh, with a boy's picture, with a bicycle. His parents are shouting at him. Ask the students to guess what the story could be about. Students read the three sentences on the PowerPoint, and then they guess um, you know, where these sentences come in the story. I'm sorry, some of the text on the PowerPoint is probably hidden behind um, the, the videos because I'm sharing my screen. So let me see if I can minimize that. Ah, yeah, okay. So now I should be able to see all the text. And then for speaking, because um, 
in an online class, it's difficult to see the students and we don't know who wants to speak. So I usually set up a rotor and I put it on a screen. So for example, everybody whose names begins with A will answer the first question. People whose names begin with B will answer the second question. Have some sort of system. And students can speak. It depends on the size of your class, so they can write in the chat box. If it's a speaking session, they should be, you know, they should have the opportunity to speak, unmute them. So experiential activities. Uh, so the task is that the students are asked, you know, to think about the story and imagine what is happening as they read. And then after they read, you know, they react by telling a partner if the boy's punishment was appropriate and what would you have done if you were the parents. And then there is a set of questions about, uh, you know, around emotions and feelings in reaction to the story. So how do we do this online? They can still think online. And then I always put my students in pairs and groups beforehand. So I have a slide with their names, um, which shows what pairs and groups they are in. Um, and then I get them to work in channels if it's teams, or I set up WhatsApp groups for them to work on, um, work in groups and pairs. Uh, and I always put the instructions on the screen and I put the instructions, instruction slide in there uh, in the chat box as well, uh, because sometimes they may not be able to see the main screen. And I make my materials available before the lesson and I provide an answer key after the lesson. So plenty of scaffolding. Okay, so how do we manage the intake response activity online? So there are some questions to focus on language. Um, so again, I get the students to work in pairs and groups, naming the pairs and groups, making sure that the task is available to them in the chat box or the Teams channel that they are in, or the Zoom breakout room. And I get them to work on the questions and build in time to, for them to respond. So the development activity is about lexical chunks in this case. So I give them examples of lexical chunks from the story, get them to think about what are lexical chunks, what are collocations, and then as before, I nominate the answers to speak their answers uh, and have the answers ready on the next slide. And I know we worry, you know, about giving students answers, but in an online environment, they need plenty of clues. Also, students can write the answers with markers and just hold up a sheet in front of the camera. Um, so here I share a resource and there is a link to this. This is a, a Google Doc actually, which compares face-to-face uh, -face activities with online synch synchronous and asynchronous activities and what to do if there is no access to the internet or if you're in the classroom, but in a physically distanced classroom where uh, the students are sitting two meters apart or one meter apart. So I would really recommend that you look at this Google Doc. It's a very useful resource. So some general principles around materials writing in terms of design and content. So think about how much you are offering in each unit. How are the pages and screens laid out? And be consistent in the layout of the screen, but uh, very the language and the range of uh, activities. So have a set of activities to choose from, but you can vary these um, from unit to unit, but there needs to be some consistency and a pattern. So have a balance of skills in each unit in terms of speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Make sure that these skills, not just language, but the skills are developed across the units. Make sure there is attention to study skills as well. These need to be embedded. Think of the topics, ask the students to choose the topics before the course begins. And then see the, the uh, common European framework for level suitable language and also language corpora. Um, and then make sure the instructions are clear. 
and that the instructions are not being used to develop the language. You know, the language development comes after the instructions. So a word about instructions. These need to stand out as instructions. It needs to be clear to the students that these instructions they use a different color, perhaps, or a different font. They need to be split up and presented in the order the activity is to be carried out on. So, you know, give them as stages and repeat them. Have it on the slide in an online environment, but also speak the instructions more than once. Check back with the students whether they have actually heard the instructions. Uh, give them examples and have one action per instruction. Use pictures. Um, the instructions need to be quite specific and they need to be standard and consistent. So, you know, don't be afraid of repetition. For the same type of activity, use the same language, not new language to give the instructions. Um, don't be shy about, um, you know, using the first language or a shared language to give instructions. Have a first language policy in your classroom. Agree this in the first session of the course. As I said before, written and verbal instructions, repeat and check, give examples, ask students to give examples to see if they've understood. And then, you know, check a few minutes into the task or the activity, you know, to make sure that they are on task and then put them in the chat box as well. So some general principles about online materials now. So for me, there are three key principles. Online materials need to be accessible. So along with putting them on your VLE, your virtual learning environment, before the session, make sure they're downloadable. So, you know, put them on the live screen, but have a downloadable PDF or PowerPoint or a Word document. They need to be engaging for the students. So involve the students in choice of activity, especially topics and pictures and they need to allow for learning. Second language principles, so exposure and input, there needs to be plenty of exposure to the language. Um, there needs to be opportunities for practice through interaction and motivation resulting from successful interaction. So if you notice, I am recapping on some of the things I said before. And so this is important in a language session as well. So in terms of engagement, it's that bit about community Excuse me, Naima, versus you competition. have only five minutes left. Five okay, minutes. thank you, Frida. Um, so I'm going to race on with this. So make students partners. Um, make sure that you think at course level, involve the students in choosing topics. Uh, get the students to bring in text. So before the course begins, you know, set a rota for week four. You know, these two students are going to bring in the text. For week six, these students are going to bring in the text. With my students, I provide an overview of the week before the week so that they know what to expect. I make it quite short, this overview. So this overview is for three two-hour sessions in one week. Um, so have a routine for each session, provide students with a checklist of what they need. So I would just like to share some principles for the good, um, for the good online learner, good online classrooms and good online learners. So good online classrooms recognize learning is a social process. They provide opportunities for exposure and input. So back to second language acquisition, practice through interaction, and they motivate by engaging the students, making students partners, and providing opportunities for success through short, achievable tasks. And I draw in Ruben for this. So learners have some responsibilities as well. They should look at the materials before the start of the course, they are persistent, so even if they feel a bit lost, they need to keep trying and ask for help. They manage their time, so they remind, they put reminders in their phone because they are not physically on campus. They need to remember to join the online session. They plan their week. They have mini goals and year-long goals. If they have an opportunity for assessment,
Thank you very much, Naima, for your presentation. Can you hear me? Want to? Can you hear me, Naima? Unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? I still can't hear you. Okay, I can see that in from the chat box that people have had problems um, with the internet. Yes, yeah, students can't be responsible for the low internet in the area. So in some countries, what governments have done is um, they have increased the broadband width. Frida, I still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Nice to see you here, Farooq. Can you hear me? I can't Naima? hear you, Frida. Oh, you cannot? Do you want to WhatsApp me, Frida? I'm here. Should I unmute? Yes. Can you hear me, Naima? Naima? Can you hear me? Yes, Frida. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, is it okay if I respond to some of the comments in the chat box? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. please do. Okay, so I can see, you know, the issues that people have put there. Thank you very much for sharing to begin with and being honest about the issues. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of issues, and actually this is global. It's not just Indonesia. This happens in the UK as well uh, and in other countries. I've been talking with teachers in, in India, uh, in Pakistan and, of course, the UK. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it, yes, so governments have worked to improve the broadband in the region. So institutions, educational institutions have got together and spoken with the local and national governments to improve the broadband. Also, our universities usually send out instructions because there are things to do with broadband that we can improve on a device as well. We can put up certain settings and so on, which will improve the broadband on our device. And so our university, for instance, set, sends out those instructions. I understand if there is a power cut and the connection is lost. So, you know, like this session is being recorded. We record our sessions and we put them um, in the in the platform that we are using so i would recommend not use more than two platforms okay so now i'm going to look at the chat box so there is a question here about um sort of how to provide opportunities for interaction so i'm sorry because of the number of uh, participants here i wasn't able to model those opportunities but if you go back to my PowerPoint, which will be available, I think, um, you know, as part of the recording, uh, have built in silence. So set up those tasks, get the students to read the story. And before reading the story, set up that task. So it's about planning your time in the session. And if you have 30 students and it's a short session, you can set up a rota so that the students are um, uh, you know, sort of you get five students or 10 students to speak in each session and build in time so that maybe everybody gets to speak for maybe 30 seconds. 30 seconds can be a long time to speak in a foreign language. OK, so that's about 15 minutes uh, of an hour long session if you have 30 students in your classroom. And then in each session, maybe 10 students 
can do a task where they speak for a longer time. You can also get students to record their two minute sessions that they can then listen to each other outside the lesson if it's an hour long lesson. Okay, so these, these are strategies. And then there is a question from Farooq where materials and online, are, online means are limited and not accessible to all students. So, um, okay, yes. So there are actually a number of activities that students can do offline and still in an interactive manner. Uh, the same, same story reading task can be done asynchronously uh, using WhatsApp. Uh, so I'll actually, if, if the organizers are okay with this, I'll share an article uh, from Language Issues. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a teacher's um, journal that I edit. Um, and there's a very useful article by one of the ESOL teachers in the UK about offline activities. Uh, so I'll share this with the organizers and hopefully you'll be able to put this out for um, members of this conference, delegates, okay? Sorry, Naima. I'd like yeah. to read out one question that has been raised Thank by you. one of the participants. Thank you. Um, Thank you. From Rambert uh, from Universitas Cendrawasi. He is asking you about how can we as teachers allow student, student choice? Yes, yes. Million dollar question. Okay. So I'll show you what I do. So, of course, you know, students don't always, uh, well, they know what they need in terms of language, but they're not always able to articulate this. And of course, if they have, you know, if, if a language is being taught as a foreign language, the students may not know what language they need because they don't know what the target situations are. So they can have choice in topics maybe. So before a course begins, if I know which students are enrolled, I usually send them an email and set up a virtual space or just get them to email me back about which uh, topics they are interested in or just, uh, you know, a short three question questionnaire about what do they do and what do they enjoy doing. So a question like, what do they use the internet for? Um, what kind of, or what are the three websites that they have accessed in the last 24 hours? Or what, you know, three online platforms they have accessed? So by online platforms, I mean things like Instagram or Facebook. So what have they accessed in the last 24 hours and how they have used it? So this gives me an idea of their interests. And I draw on this to choose texts and activities. And then, of course, sometimes I will ask them to, uh, you know, choose text. So I'll set, I'll set very clear guidelines. So I'll ask them to choose, um, you know, three minute videos in the target language, in English perhaps, um, and then send those to me first. Um, and then I will, you know, make sure that these are suitable. If they are not, at least it will give me an idea of the topic the students are interested in. And I'll choose a suitable video in that topic. Uh, and then I'll use that two or three weeks later. So this gives students choice. Then during the lesson, I'll set up parallel activities or maybe two texts. So I'll get them to choose which text they would like to read. Um, and, you know, for this, we need time for preparation, which is why I keep recommending that, you know, as teachers, and I know that teachers in Indonesia are very collaborative. I have worked with teachers in Indonesia before, and I love how all of you come together and work together. So, you know, share out the course, you know, say that you know, three of you are going to prepare the materials for these two weeks, three of you are going to prepare for the next two weeks. Um, and and then you know share the materials. Uh, this will save you time. So I I hope this answers a bit of your question. It's harder for lower level students, of course, uh, to give them choice. Okay, thank you, Naima. Another question from Margareta Sulistiowardani. Uh, yeah. She is thanking you for the presentation and she is interested in knowing more about social interaction. Uh, she is a student teacher 
and has to deal with more than 30 students. And it is hard to make sure that each student has opportunity for interaction. So she would like to know if you have suggestion about any strategy that can help cope with that issue. Yes, yes, I, I understand. Um, and thank you for your question, because I am sure that this is, you know, this is a question that many people have. So in terms of social interaction, so a classroom is a virtual classroom or a physical class, physical classroom is a social space and social interaction is not always spoken. So whenever we set a speaking task or ask the students to work in groups or pairs on a writing task, there is social interaction. Even, you know, if we have chosen the topic and the target language, the way they interact with each other is social. So giving 30 students an opportunity to share what they have produced. Okay, so what I would do is to make the task available in a very clear manner before the session. And yes, I know not all students will look at the work before the session, but usually about a third of the students in the class will have. So then get them to produce what, you know, whatever the spoken language is or the written task is to share that in the classroom. This, in terms of spoken language, it could be a role play. You could get them to write a story or a small, you know, three minute drama. So again, it's how you set the task. The instructions need to be very clear and you need to set time limits. In, in terms of how much time they're going to have during the session to speak. Okay, so they could share as a group their role play or their story in the class. And you could get 10 students to share in each lesson. Uh, the other 20 can react in the chat box or respond in the chat box. Um, and then again, you can sh set short tasks where each student gets to speak for 30 seconds. And in a student, in, in, a, in a class with 30 students, you know, that comes to about, I think, what, 10 or 15 minutes probably. So, you know, give them that time, that's important. And yes, the first time you do this, you know, they'll stop and start, they'll go slightly over the 30 seconds. And I usually get one of the other students to manage the time. So it's not as though I am stopping them after 30 seconds. Then they will not feel so intimidated if it is one of their peers who stops them. So it's all about instructions and timing and trying again and again. The first time it won't work, but be persistent. If you keep doing this in each lesson, eventually it will work. Okay, yeah, thank you, Naima. Um, well, audience, uh, we have an announcement to make. It is raining uh, very hard here, so if there is a power loss, please stay online, and normally the power will be back in two minutes. Uh, now let me continue to read out the question for you, Naima. Um, here we have a question from uh, Mr. Khalil Jabil. Uh, he is asking you about this. It's Usually during the learning process, students build up their personality by, communi by communicating directly with different teachers. But in the new normal, learning via internet, do you think this type of learning can play a negative or positive role on building student personality and how? Thank you. Yes, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, Khalid, uh, because, yeah, interaction is not the same. For instance, now, I really can't see all of you. So, you know, when I would, I would be physically at a conference, even if there were, you know, 1,100 people in the hall, I could still see them and get some clues. Uh, so, again, it's about creating those opportunities. So when I do online sessions, um, I tend not to have a background so that they can see me in my natural environment. Of course, I, may, I make sure that there is no washing drying behind me on my radiator. 
you know, it's it's um, it's not too domestic what they can see behind me. Um, and then I do uh, at our university we have a tutorial system. So in addition to the synchronous whole class sessions, we can do short tutorials with students. These could be in one to one or in groups of three or four. And this is where that more, how can I put it, a more specific interaction can take place. And again, I hand it over to the students. I give them the topics and ask them to say how they would, you know, what they would like to see happening in these shorter five to 15 minute sessions with two or three of them. Unless it's about an assignment, I avoid one-to-one -one tutorials because it can be quite intimidating for the student. I tend to um, encourage them to you know, meet with the teacher in groups of three to five, uh, so that you know, it's more of a group activity and there is room for silence. Silence is very important. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Naima, for their responses. I think uh, we, are constrained by time. Um, is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, although I believe that uh, you may still have burning question to ask to Dr. Naima Han. Unfortunately, uh, we are once again constrained by time. So I would like to uh, highlight a few points that Dr. Han has made in her presentation. Well, considering the situation now, then we need to adjust the uh, materials, yeah, to make our practice, our instructional practice more successful. However, we need to consider varied aspects such as the learner's profile, the teacher's profile, the SLA principles, as well as the ass assessment. Well, although uh, there will be some problems with that, but we still need to strive with uh, trying to set up uh, online instruction which are able to facilitate our students. Yeah. So Dr. Naima Han has highlighted uh, the principles for making online materials and I believe you can make the most of what she has presented. Um, now, um, on behalf of the seven LLTC committee, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Naima Han for her willingness to share the ideas, to share the thoughts, with all of us and also expertise, especially in adapting materials for uh, pandemic situation like what we are facing now. Well, in addition to that, uh, I would like to thank all the audience um, for tuning in with us, for being patient with us, although we have some technical problems in between. Uh, and thank you for being with us both in Zoom as well as on YouTube channel. Well, hopefully we can learn a lot from this uh, fruitful session uh, whereby Dr. Han has uh, stressed the importance of silence, yeah, uh, where it is very important for us to reflect on our own practices. And once again, I hope you can uh, try to adjust what uh, Dr. Naima Han has presented into your own context. Well, thank you once again, Naima, for your insightful presentation on uh, challenges and opportunities for language learning in the new era. I will give the time back to our Master of Ceremony Ibu Mita, please thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ibu Frida. Thank you very much, Dr. Naima Han, and also Dr. Made Frida Yulia. Uh, apologies for the slight glitch with the quality of sounds and the internet connection because it's raining cats and dogs at the moment in Yogyakarta. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the end of our day one conference. But before I close this conf uh, the first day of the conference, let us have a picture session. So I would like everyone to open the cameras uh, for those who are in Zoom. And I will give you the cues when to smile. Hopefully it will not be as, oh, 10 times? Oh, oh eight times, okay, <laughs> sorry. All right, are we ready? Okay, one, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, LLTC. One, two, three, LLTC. One, two, three, LLTC. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you very much for your cooperation. Uh, we will meet again tomorrow at 9 a.m. and we will start the day by listening to the fourth keynote speech from Ibu Professor Novita Dewi. The Zoom main room will be opened at 8.30 in the morning, Western Indonesian time. The Zoom link is provided in your program book and also in the chat room, in the Zoom chat room. Remember to fill out the exit ticket for day one. The link is already available in the Zoom chat room and uh, it will be available only until 4 p.m. So please make sure that you uh, go to your Zoom chat room uh, as soon as possible. Please note that you will be eligible to receive the e-certificate only if you have submitted exit ticket day one and day two and have registered your email in the LLTC website. The parallel sessions will be accessible in our PBI USD YouTube channel in the playlist section later tonight. Thank you once again. Stay safe, stay healthy, follow the health protocol, and see you tomorrow. Have a great Friday. Sampai jumpa lagi. Thank you, everyone.